I do. Clifford, C L I F F O R D, Mog, M O G G. Thank you very much, Mr. Mog. Thank you. Um, Your Honor, uh, we ended yesterday's proceedings. We hadn't played like the last eight or so minutes of what's been admitted as states um, 314, so we're going to. With the court's permission, finish that, and then I'll resume questioning. Okay. Okay. Um, do you have his property? Yeah, thank you.
Is there calls that you need to make right now, maybe, to get a hold of her or anything we can help you with? No, I'd probably do it myself. Okay. Well, um, let's just go out here real quick and get a couple things done, and then we'll get you together, and we'll head over there and start getting some of this stuff done so that you can get your car and make whatever arrangements you want to make for tonight. And what we'll probably do is um, we'll lock the house out and seal it tonight, and then uh, let you make arrangements then to, uh, to get things moved out or whatever you need to do. How long does all this take, like, uh, I guess, to make funeral arrangements and stuff? Well, what will happen is um, this evening, once we're done or we're to a point where we're finished processing inside the house and uh, your wife can be uh, removed from the house and we'll get him out of there, uh, they'll go to the coroner's office and then uh, tomorrow, probably tomorrow morning, um, there'll be an autopsy of your wife. And then once the autopsy is completed, then the medical examiner will release uh, your wife to the funeral home that picked her up uh, this evening. And we'll be able to give you that information. The coroner will probably also be at the house and they'll want to talk to you. Um, but uh, they'll be able to give you a little bit more detail about uh, which funeral home is going to take your wife tonight to the coroner's office and then uh, how you can go about making arrangements for your wife uh, tomorrow once the autopsy is completed. Colleen's like five months pregnant right now. Is she married? What's her husband doing? Uh, Sound man at one of the casinos. How long have they been married? Mm, quite a while. Might be better to talk to him yeah, first. That's absolutely better to But we can get you over to your house and at least get you your phone and see if we can get some of this stuff started for you. Any other questions you have right now? Um, I'll just run out here and make a quick phone call, and then um, I'll get you and we'll go out and find the apartments where Mike was staying, and I'll get you back over to the house. Well, you can actually, the, the guard at the place probably can tell you the apartments. Okay, and we'll try to do that once we get there. We'll just talk to him. We're not going to go to the apartment with you. And then uh, I'll get you back over to your house. You said um, your cell phone or your wife's cell phone, one of the others inside the house? I have, yeah, I think so. Okay. I don't have mine. We took it. Or... Who? The officer? I don't know. Some, I've seen it somewhere. Somebody had it. Okay. It might be in a bag. There's a bag of. They said your property. I don't know what's in it. I don't look at it. Okay. But it's in the car right upstairs. So we'll give you all that stuff, and then if your phone's in there, you can make whatever calls we need to. We'll assist you however we can. Yeah, I would need it because it has all the phone numbers in it because I don't uh, I don't know my card or anything. Okay. Does Mike wear a cowboy boots? Uh, Sharon gave me some cowboy boots the other day. Okay. Uh, her, her husband died in cowboy boots. I don't know if it's a cowboy boots, like dressy boots. Okay. And if he were wearing dark brown gardening gloves, is that something he would have brought, or do you think that's something he might have found around your house? That's something you would have around your house? Oh. There's a lot of gloves around my house, I don't know. They're like cotton, they're just a cheap old cotton gardening gloves, or just pretty white fingers. I don't know. I don't think so. I think ours are 
I mean, we had them there before, but I don't think he would have gotten them there. But what about this mask? Any idea? Would he have brought that with him, or do you have a little bit of a mask around your house? I probably do have some masks in the... They're not like that, though. They're more like a motorcycle. I got them for Christmas one year that kind of slide. They're like a... They might be pond or something. They might like... I want to say Kevlar, but that's not like... Rubber legs. Like what? The legs. Yeah, like diamond stuff. Like diamond gear. Well, the other... Yeah, that could, could be like that, yeah. Because I got a... This is my gave it to me for a Christmas present one year. That's a bike thing, but... And then I keep... Used to have them on the way around the back, but I had a, you know, foot chest with it had its own air hoses and stuff, and jacks and little portable heaters and stuff you'd have if you got stuff you'd be top and whatever and full drive with extra clothes and stuff, and there might be a mask in there, but you know, I think I think it's that new green stuff. And it would not even be I think it's like you know, it's for a long time. Alright, um, let's just set out here for a minute and I'll be back with you. Can you use that from your thing? I do, actually. Alright. Detective Mogg, um, after that interview concluded, um, what what did you do with uh, Mr. Randolph? So we uh, allowed Mr. Randolph to use the bathroom. Then we took him to a, um, the Painter Desert um, residence area off of Ann Road, and I believe it's Centennial, the 95 in that area. Uh, he pointed it out to us. We pulled up, spoke to the uh, security guard at the gate who told us that he was familiar with Michael Miller and where uh, Mr. Miller's relatives lived in the complex. And that was as much as we did at Painted Desert that night, and then we took him back to the residence. And the, the residence being the Rancho Santa Fe one? That's correct. Okay. Now, there was discussion um, in the course of the interview where I think Mr. Randolph mentioned that it had taken like 20 or 30 minutes for officers to get inside the house. Yes. Um, are you familiar with the, the 911 in this case? I am. And what does that indicate to you in terms of timing? So I listened to the 911 call and watched the timer on the call. If the call comes in at 8.45 p.m. approximately. Just, just for the record, I'm going to object to this. That it's not accurate. It is 8.44, 54 seconds. And if he's going to testify, I really think the 911 call should either be in so the jury can hear it or that he can get his, the numbers that are accurate, because that's, they keep saying 845, it's not 845. What was the time? 844 and 54 seconds. Okay, so six, six seconds short of 845? That's correct. Okay. Um, and uh, from your review of that um, call, can you hear um, on the call officers entering? Yes. And is it less than 30 minutes? Yes. Now, after you had um, that interview with Mr. Randolph, um, were there things in the interview um, that you um, that struck you as an investigator? Yes, there was. Um, such as? So at the very beginning, when Mr. Randolph described how he had met Mr. Miller, that he was in a convenience store, that Mr. Miller was in front of him purchasing some beer, that uh, Mr. Miller confides in him, that the clerk is always IDing him or carding him when he purchases beer, and that he does this all the time, and he's always getting carded, but today he forgot his ID. To me, I figured that if the clerk knew you enough to card you every time. I'm asking about what struck him as an investigator, not for the truth of the matter asserted, Your Honor. He can absolutely testify to what he was thinking that um, if the clerk knew you enough to card you every time that 
if they've carded you today and you're back in tomorrow, they may remember that you have been carded. Also, Mr. Miller didn't look anything like he was 21 years old. Um, then after that, when Mr. Randolph purchased or was going to purchase the beer <coughs> for Mr. Miller, Mr. Miller said, no, you keep that one, I want this one, and picked up a different beer. So then the purchase is made, Mr. Randolph and Mr. Miller leave, and then Mr. Randolph describes how he sees Mr. Miller walking down the street and decides that he's going to pick him up and give him a ride. And it just struck me as odd that this is a person you met less than five minutes ago, and you're giving him a ride home, and now you're going to sit in front of his house and talk to him for an hour. So after that, the next thing um, that I thought was odd was that uh, Mr. Randolph told us that he had hired Mr. Miller to do some odd jobs around the house and that he was always asking him for money and he would loan him money or he would do work in exchange for money and that Mrs. Randolph was upset with the fact that he was always loaning him money. Um, Mrs. Randolph even made mention that um, Mr. Miller or Mr. Ra Randolph needed to find some male friends. Um, I thought that was a little odd. Then um, Mr. Randolph mentions that Mr. Miller is probably not the best worker, but he continues to employ him anyway. Then the next thing that struck me as unusual was that uh, Mr. Randolph was leaving town. Hold on there, one second. Just that this is just becoming a narrative. It's not a question and answer. It's just a narrative of what he thinks was on. Well, I mean, it is a long answer. I'll say that, but um, it is what struck him about um, the interview as an investigator that caused him concern. So, I mean, I can break it up and say anything else every time, but um, I will allow him to testify to what struck him as an investigator. Uh, the next thing I thought that was odd was that um, Mr. Randolph and his wife purportedly were leaving the next day to go to Utah, and I believe he said that Mr. Miller was aware of that. Then he was with Mr. Miller approximately three hours before the incident happens. Um, so let me, let me pause you there. Um, you mentioned um, that um, according to Mr. Randolph, uh, Mr. Miller was aware that Mr. and Mrs. Randolph were going to leave town. I believe that's what he told me. Why did that strike you as strange in terms of this case? Because if somebody was going to leave town and you were aware of it, why would you break into their house this evening why wouldn't you wait until they were out of town when there was no chance that they would come home? Did you, um, do you remember in the interview um, Mr. Randolph talking about how he always um, carries a loaded weapon on his person? I do. Um, but he, I believe he says in the interview that he just happened to not have it on him that night. That's correct. Was that... Um, like part of what form, was that also an impression that you had with regard to the interview? It was something I noted, but the fact that he was going to a casino, I mean, he did tell us that he was under the impression he could carry a gun anywhere because of reciprocal laws between carrying concealed weapons in Utah and Nevada. Um, but it was something that I did note. Now, it, in the interview, it looks like you actually sketch out um, a diagram of the layout of the Randolph um, residents. I did. And he points out various um, things he was doing or, or sort of how this interaction with Mr. Miller played out during the course of the interview? Yes. May I approach your honor? Yes. Sir, I'm sure you have been marked the state's proposed 214. Do you recognize what that is? I do. What is it? This is a crime scene diagram drawn by our crime scene investigators. Now, you sketched yours by hand during the interview, but does this exhibit fairly and accurately depict the layout of the Randolph residence? It does. State moves to admit 214. No objection. Okay, 214 will be admitted. Trying to do two, Your Honor. Thank 
Thank you. Okay. Um, Detective Ma, can you see that on your monitor? Yes. Okay. Can you just, I mean, just overall orient um, the members of the jury, like where the garage is, where the front door is, where the backyard of the house is? So the garage is where the two vehicles are illustrated. That would be on the north side of the house. The master bedroom in the family room area, kitchen and all that is on the south side of the house. Uh, as soon as you enter the residence from the garage, there's a door there. Um, immediately to the left is a washer dryer. Then as you pass the washer dryer, the next room there is what I believe was an office. Uh, then just down from that is another room that um, Mr. Randolph referred to as his drum room or his music room. Then at the end of the hallway on the south side of the residence is the master bedroom. Just north of the master bedroom as you're coming back north in the hallway on the right hand side would be the bathroom. Then there's a hallway which leads into the living room area, the kitchen, and then there's another den family room. Um, on the north side of the house near the front door. Okay. And then the front door is located there in the living room. Okay, so here, here's the front door, right? Yes. And then this is the garage area? That's correct. This is the location of uh, Mrs. Randolph? Yes. And this is the master bedroom right here? Correct. This is the, the drum room or the music room? Yes. That's a bathroom? Yes. And then there's sort of a, an office type room here? Correct. Um, there's a door leading uh, into the house, like from the garage into the house at that location? Yes. And then this is the location of Mr. Miller, right? Correct. Okay. Um, did Mr. Randolph, um, did he describe how um, Mrs. Randolph entered the, the house? He did. Can you kind of orient us on the diagram how um, he described her entering the house? So as they arrived home, he pulled into the driveway, which is on the north side of the uh, garage. He opened up the garage. Mrs. Randolph was the passenger. She stepped out of the vehicle and went through the garage into the door that leads into the house and Excuse into the residence. I think if you, um, there's a mouse there that might, oh. might kind of give you a little bit of an arrow. Okay. This is the driveway right here. Okay. When Mr. Randolph arrived home with his wife, she was in the passenger seat. He was driving. He stopped in the driveway to allow her to get out because there wasn't enough room for her and him to exit the vehicle because of some shelving that was on the side of the garage. So he allows her to exit. She walks through the garage, through the open garage door, and then goes into the residence through this door right here. Okay. Now, um Mr. Randolph follows, the, according to him, that same path into the house? Yes. Okay. And then he describes um, seeing a figure or something kind of move from one side of the hallway to the other? Correct. Can you point that out on the um, diagram for the jurors, please? So the way Mr. Randolph describes this is as he parks his vehicle, he gets out, he opens up the door leading into the house. As he stands about right here in the doorway area, the hallway is illuminated by a light that was right here on a table. And as he looked down the hallway, he stated that he believed he saw someone jump from the bathroom area here across the hallway toward the drum room. And then he told me that maybe it was just he saw someone peek around the corner of the drum room right here. Okay. Now, in, where did Mr. Randolph um, describe shooting Mr. Miller on our diagram? So after seeing the movement, Mr. Randolph says that he steps into this bedroom here and then described, and I later saw this shoe rack, it's a hanging rack um, that's in the closet right here, that he reached into that closet and stepped into the room as he saw a person coming down the hallway toward him. He reached into the closet, grabbed his Mokroff 9mm pistol, which was loaded, 
and an extra clip of ammunition for the pistol. And as he stepped into the doorway here, he stated that he was confronted by this person whom at that point he said he didn't know who it was and that this person had a mask on and that the mask, they bumped into each other and I believe he said the mask kind of partially moved up on his face. And um, did he describe then at that time that he um, started firing at the intruder? He said that they basically cleared a little bit of distance, so created a little bit of space between the two of them. And then he started to draw his pistol up, and he began to fire at this person who was in his house. And he continued to fire as this person moved down the hallway here toward the garage door. Once the person went through the door, he continued firing while the person was in the garage on the floor. Okay. Um, in the hallway, on the walls, did you see any um, evidence of like secondary strikes or any ballistic evidence, anything to indicate to you that there was a shooting that occurred in the hallway? I saw no bullet impacts in the walls of the hallway. The only cartridge case that I saw was on the floor near this doorway down here leading into the garage, and I believe that's marked with number three. Yeah, so that's, it's, it's inside, but it's right at the base of the doorway of the, the, the door that goes between the garage and the house? That's correct. Okay. Other than that, um, no cases, no strikes, nothing um, to indicate any kind of shooting occurred in that hallway? Nothing that would indicate that a shooting occurred in the hallway based on my familiarization with semi-automatic handguns. Okay. Um, did he, in the interview, um, describe to you, well, yeah, did he describe to you where uh, he locates the gun that is used to kill Sharon? He said that the gun, ultimately he finds the gun underneath Mr. Miller's person. Um, I don't recall if he said he found it in his um, sweatshirt or if he found it in his waistband or if he was just lying on top of it. But the one thing that was odd was he looked in a couple of bags. It's beyond the scope of the question. So I'll, re I'll, I'll rephrase. Let, let, me ask, let me ask this question. There is a, in this first bedroom here um, by Sharon Randolph, uh, there's an item of evidence. Um, are you familiar with what that item was? I am. And what was there? That's a 38 caliber snub nose revolver. It's got about a two and a half inch barrel, I believe. Okay. And um, according to Mr. Randolph, he locates that gun at some point when he's um, administering aid to Sharon? That's correct. Okay. So according to Mr. Randolph, the intruder abandoned that gun at some point? Yes. Okay. And then proceeded down the hallway? Yes. Now, there, it, later in the interview, he describes discovering a gun in the vicinity of Mr. Miller? Yes. Um, and so there's a second gun as well, right? Correct. And there's actually a third gun if you count the one that Mr. Randolph had? Yes. What does Mr. Randolph say he did with the gun associate, you know, more closely associated to the area of Mr. Miller? So after he took the gun from the area of Mr. Miller, he carried that gun into the residence through the door and then at this bedroom doorway here, he said he tossed it into the room. I believe he said he was aiming for the trash can, but it could have landed somewhere else. That pistol was found lying on top of some clothing, which was on top of a black suitcase in this room near the front part of this closet. Okay. So um, according to Mr. Randolph, the intruder, Mr. Miller, was attempting to exit um, the residence in the direction of the garage. Would that be fair? Yes. From your observations of the residence, um, did it appear that there were other areas of the house where you could um, exit the residence? Yes. Where, where would those have been located? Uh, the front door located right here, 
And then the back double doors over here. Okay. Um, in the uh, in your, I know you didn't have the scene responsibilities, but um, you mentioned, I think, on yesterday about um, there was ransacking or there was evidence of ransacking at the residence. I didn't see evidence of ransacking in the hallway area or the living room area that I went into initially. Okay. I later walked through the scene. Did you, in walking through the scene, um, did it appear that the house had been ransacked at all? No. Um, what did you see in, um, in the master bedroom in terms of whether or not there had been any displacement or what, how would you describe how that looked? So when I first walked into the master bedroom, this is after I completed the interview with Mr. Randolph, um, I noticed that there was a couple of drawers pulled out of a dresser uh, in the bedroom, and that I believe there was a bra just like hanging over the edge. But when I looked at the drawers, the drawers were almost perfectly aligned as if you were to pull them out just a few inches not far out enough where you would be sticking your hand in there right then. It didn't appear that anything in the drawers was disturbed and there was nothing lying on the floor. There was a cabinet, I believe, that was partially open, but again, I didn't see anything strewn around the room, pulled out of drawers, tossed on the floor. Uh, I found a jewelry box that had some jewelry still in the bottom of it, and I believe a piece or two in the top part that was sitting in a laundry basket. I just thought that was odd. And then as I went into the drum room, I saw the same thing in there. There were a couple drawers that were pulled open, but it didn't appear that anything within those drawers was disturbed. One of the cabinets on that dresser was open and there was two items, I don't recall what they were, lying on the floor in front of that dresser. But it almost appeared to me that they had been placed there and not just thrown onto the floor. Based on, oh, I'll, lay, I'll lay some foundation. Okay. Um, Detective Mogg, um, prior to working homicide, um, where were you assigned at Metro? So I was assigned as a patrol officer first and during that time I investigated numerous burglaries. Uh, then I went to the career criminal section after that and I was responsible for locating criminals. Then I was assigned to the robbery section and when I was assigned to the robbery section I was responsible for conducting investigations of home invasions uh, where people were home at the time, where force was used to make entry and where items were searched for by suspects. Okay. Um, based on that experience, Your Honor, um, I would ask that he be allowed to render an opinion um, about what he observed in this uh, home in terms of the ransacking or lack of ransacking. He can testify what he observed, but he can't give an opinion as to whether or not the home was ransacked. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes. Okay. Sir, I'm showing you what's been marked as State's Proposed 105 through 117. Do those fairly and accurately depict uh, how the master bedroom appeared that evening? They do. State moves to admit uh, 105 to 117. No objection. Okay, 105 to 117. Thank you. And uh, just to orient on our diagram, um, this area is the master bedroom? Yes. Okay. So 
sir, I'm putting on the overhead what's been admitted as states 105. Let me. Um, what are we looking at in that photograph? So this is looking into the master bedroom from the hallway. Um, the bed is located there where you see it. The door opens inward and to the left, and there are some drawers that were in a uh, little box that was hanging on the wall, lying on the floor. And this, uh, I'm going to zoom in on this dresser. Um, the dresser that we see, um, kind of more, well, I zoomed in on it in the photo, um, those drawers appear to be pulled out a little bit. Yes. Um, when you, uh, in your career, when you have responded to um, other burglaries and home invasions, um, is that how a dresser typically appeared? Judge, I have objection. I think this is vague, ambiguous, and calls for speculation. He's noticed as an expert, he said he has responded to hundreds of burglaries and home invasions. I'm not sure what else. Well, he can testify to what he saw in those photos, or whether or not the jury determines whether or not this is how this should be, or whether or not this is ransacked. Like, that's a jury question that they can answer. Okay, but I think the question I asked was, um, in other burglaries and home invasions, is did the dresser drawers appear like this? He can answer whether they appeared like that in other, but he can't make it. As to why that is. Okay, so in other burglaries and home invasions that you've investigated, would the appearance of these drawers be consistent with what you had seen at those other crime scenes? That was the first time I had seen drawers lined up that perfectly and not pulled out to the point where you could access the contents of the drawers or the contents being on the floor. I'm going to put on the overhead, this is States 108. What area of the master bedroom are we looking at here? This is just inside the doorway. Okay, and you mentioned that there were some drawers from a jewelry box or a jewelry thing hanging on the wall? Yes. Um, and those appear to be on the floor? That's correct. This is States 109. Let me back up just a little bit. What are we looking at in that photograph? This is that uh, box that I was talking about that was hanging on the wall next to the door. I'm putting on the overhead now, States 110. Um, different view of that same dresser that you were just speaking of? Yes. There's also a, a television in the, in the middle of the photo for lack of better identification. Correct. The cabinets below it don't appear to be open? No. This is States 111. Uh, what are we looking at in that photograph? It's a bag with uh, some clothing items in it that was sitting on the floor next to the television. Bag obviously not dumped out? No. Drawers on the lower part of the dresser not pulled out? Correct. <clears throat> this is uh, <coughs> States 112. Um, another view of the master bedroom? Yes. Um, the, the cabinet, well, let me zoom in. Do you see disturbance um, in sort of the, the headboard backing area of the, of the bed? Yes, the cabinet door is open. Okay. The drawers below it don't appear to be pulled out, is that fair? They are not. This is States uh, 115. Let me zoom back out. Just another view of the um, bedroom, is that fair? That's correct. And let me put on the overhead States 117. Sort of the right side of the bed as you're facing the bed. Yes, that was another drawer that was pulled out but it didn't appear that anything in the drawer had been disturbed. Now you, you said there was, 
I'm going to go back to states 214. Oops, wearing it the same way. Um, looking at, at 214, um, there is a bedroom kind of office area right as you enter the house to the left. Yes. Did um, that room appear disturbed to you? I don't believe so. I really didn't pay a lot of attention to that room. I mainly focused on the other ones. Approach the witness, Your Honor. Okay, I'm showing you what's been marked as states proposed 123 through 135. I'd ask you to just look through those and tell me if you recognize which room that is. Yeah. Is that? That's the office. Okay. And the state moves to admit, Your Honor, um, 123 to 135. Oh, I'm sorry. room that Mr. Randolph um, explained that he was able to recover a gun that he later used to shoot uh, Mr. Miller? That's correct. And do you recall in the interview where it was that he said he got the gun from? He described it as a shoe rack in the closet. Okay. Um, I'm putting on the overhead what's been admitted as states 123. Um, does that depict the area that uh, he was speaking of? It does. And can you just kind of point to the jury where the shoe rack was hanging according to him? Right here. And so he explains that he recovers a gun from that area and that's what he ultimately uses to shoot Mr. Miller? And a clip. And a clip. And then I think you testified earlier that he describes sort of a like a physical bumping into each other um, in a doorway Yes. Um, with Mr. Miller before he shoots him? Correct. Is that doorway depicted in this photograph? Yes. Um, and that doorway is to that long hallway between the garage and the master bedroom? Correct. Now, were you aware of whether or not there was um, prescription medication in the residence? I was aware there was. Okay. Do you, do you know if any of that appeared to be taken or would that be a question for Detective O'Kelly? That would probably be a question best addressed to him. Okay. Um, in the uh, description of the encounter that Mr. Randolph gave you on the 9th of May, um, did he describe whether or not that door leading to from the house to the garage was open or closed prior to the time he shot Mr. Miller? During the initial interview with him, he described it as being closed, but then he opened it after he retrieved the pistol from Mr. Miller. Did he talk to you about what hand Mr. Miller had his gun in, meaning the gun of Mr. Miller? I believe he said the right. Okay. 
um, in describing his um, actions that night, did he explain to you that he um, attempted to render aid or resuscitate Mrs. Randolph? He did. Um, and he said he kind of flipped her over? Correct, following the directions from the fire department operator. Okay. When you were speaking with Mr. Randolph at homicide, did you notice whether or not um, his clothes appeared to be heavily bloodstained? I did not. Did you see any evidence of blood staining at all? I don't recall seeing any. Um, there may have been some small blood stains, but I don't recall seeing them. Okay. Um, at some point um, after the 9th, um, does yourself and other detectives um, ask Mr. Randolph to do what's called a walkthrough? Yes. Um, who arranged that? I arranged it. And how did you do that? By telephone with Mr. Randolph. I believe Detective O'Kelly and I may have also spoken to him that night uh, about doing one, but then I followed up on the phone with him. And what, just, I probably should have started with this question, but what is a walkthrough? So a walkthrough is where we take a witness or a victim of a crime and we basically have them on videotape and audio recording walk us through the sequence of events that led up to the incident and then things that happened following the incident. And was there a particular time or day selected um, in order to do the walkthrough? We arranged to do the walkthrough at approximately the same time as when the incident occurred. So I believe we scheduled it for somewhere around 8, 8.30 at night. To kind of mimic the time that the incident, the incident occurred at? Yes. Okay. And who, like how did the, who from Homicide came to the walkthrough? So it was myself, Detective O'Kelly, Detective Wilson, who is Detective O'Kelly's partner, um, our sergeant, Sergeant Alby, and then I believe we had Don, I can't remember his last name, uh, our videographer from the police department was also there. Okay. So there were some detectives from Homicide, a Homicide sergeant, and then a videographer who works for Metro. Yes, and I believe a couple crime scene investigators showed up at some point. Okay. Uh, the videographer is just someone that you call up to kind of assist with doing the walkthrough? Yes, Don yeah. Bell. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> See, you got the name. Um, did, uh, did all the homicide detectives drive there and, and sort of get there ahead of Mr. Randolph? I don't believe, well, I don't recall if we got there ahead of him or as he got there, uh, but we all arrived there separately. Okay. And then ultimately Mr. Randolph arrives? Yes. Do you remember how it was that he got there? Drove. I believe he was with his brother. And so he arrives with his brother. Yes. Um, who greets them? I do. And do you introduce yourself to the brother? Or I mean, Mr. Randolph already knows you, but. Yes, I would have introduced myself to him, and then I would have explained to Mr. Randolph what we were going to do. Okay. And um, the purpose was for him to kind of walk through within the house what happened, um, what his version of events was between himself and Mr. Miller that night? Yes. And that uh, recording was ultimately sent to the DA's office and the defense? It was. Um, Your Honor, the state um, moves to admit and publish 317, which is the walkthrough. No objection. 317? No objection. Okay, 317. Oh, sorry. Here and explain to us what your understanding is of what we're going to do here. My name is Tom Randolph, and 
that's my understanding. We're doing a walkthrough of the house, kind of a reenactment of what happened uh, last Thursday. And it's your desire to come out here and do this for us, right, so we can get an understanding of what was going on? It's my desire, not my desire, but I'm cooperating with you. Okay. And you came out here on your own free will, right? Correct. The driveway about when I start to make the curve about right. About there, we start opening the door up. I will stop because there's not enough room for both cars to get in there. We can't get both cars in and get both people out. So I stop the car. Sharon gets out. She had the steak and lobster from um, charcoal grill or something. So she gets out, closes the door. She goes on in, starts walking in. I give her a little bit of head start, get to the door. I start pulling in. By then she's pretty much got in. I may not be able to get the car in at all because of the people moving the car when they clean. But I'll try. She's already in the house. She's going in the house about right now. I'm not going to be able to get out of the car, so I'm going to have to move the car over. I can't get out. <coughs> Well, I actually start shutting the door as I get in. I would have already shut the door. It would have been coming down as I start getting out. <sighs> This is about how close it was that night, so that's probably... This is it, just coming on in the house. Now this door was closed, I open it up. I get right here and Sharon's laying, in the floor, face down. Her head's just barely, I mean barely in the bedroom with that. And I stopped right about here, had the door, I said, Sharon, Sharon. And I seen the, um, the bag from charcoal steak or whatever, and it's really a bright red. And this hall light, this hall light wasn't on at the time. So just about like this, and I turned the light on myself. As we got in, and um, I could see that red, that red thing that was up underneath her, and I thought it was blood. I thought that was blood then, and I started to get nervous about backing off. And I actually came to the door, and I touched it, and then I stopped and put it back down because I thought, now this is. I was going to go get a neighbor, and they took the something like that. And about, about right here when I was like this, I was trying to kind of get a view. I thought it just seemed like a shadow or something over this way. And I remembered that there's a, the 9 mm right up here because earlier I took in all my guns, put them in a suitcase, was going to take them to Utah and switch the guns around. I reached right up here, got the gun, and as I got the gun, there's also an extra clip. There's a few up there, but I got the gun and the clip. Show us in there where it's at. Right, normally it would be right in here. Right in here. And I still, you know, I was being trying to be attentive to where's, you know, what's going on out there. And like I said, I kind of, and I'd already started to run, and then I just reached up just like that, grabbed it, stuck it in my pocket, came around just like that. About that time, he's right up on me. Just right up on me. We actually touched right about here. And he's short. 
is short. And when he, I don't know if he gave me an elbow, but as we came around like that, I was kind of coming out. I was actually going to try to be slow, you know, and look out, but it just happened too quick. We came up and he kind of banged into me about right here. And he went over to about right here, and somewhere along here, I bit my mouth or something, trying to say something, like, what the fuck, or something. And he looked, kind of like, I don't know if he was looking here to see if there was somebody else or what. And there was a, he had on a sweatshirt, and I don't remember if I seen the handle in the sweatshirt, if I seen the handle in his pants, but he was doing something, going for something down in here. And as we got up in here, he kind of rushed up on me a little bit, and that's when I pushed him, boom, 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 and he started going out toward the shed. I don't know how many times they shot him, but I just, just kept right up going, boom, 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 and he just lay in there, just lay in there. And I look back as I'm trying to make sure everything's cool, kind of stepping back like that, and about that time, I heard the really, really loud noise. And what had happened is I guess he hit the refrigerator and the, help me here, the fire extinguisher. fire extinguisher. The fire extinguisher fell down. I didn't know what it was, but it made a loud clunk. And I was kind of, like I said, I was kind of looking back because I don't hear well. And I can't tell depth perception anything. And... When I heard the noise, I, I was kind of, like I said, backing up and kind of trying to make sure there's nothing else going on. And when I heard that noise, it really did scare me. I went, ah, ah. Except the door. Except the door didn't come down. It stayed just like it was open. I had. And I, I actually got close. Ah, ah. And I don't know if I shot him once, I shot him twice. And then started coming back down this way. He wasn't moving. He, uh, some noise. Come back down this way. I mean, real, just, you know. Sharon? Sharon! Sharon! She's not. trying to see if anything else is going on. You know, like there's anybody around. And I came in here and then I started to I started going here and then I and Sharon's laying right here. And I think I turned this light on then. Turned that light on. And I did not go in there. I don't know why. I did. She was kind of in the way here. And I could see stuff all over there. I mean, stuff. Um, these boxes. Uh, there was some clothes. The drawers was open. But she was laying here. And by then, I could tell she was hurt really, really bad. I mean, the blood was just then You could see thick blood. And I came back over. And I went to call 911. And I came back over. <coughs> I didn't have my phone, and it keeps falling off of me. I come back through here, and just kind of, you know, just didn't know what to do. I just kind of looking around. phone in my pocket and I thought about Sharon's cell phone and I looked around because sometimes she sits it on the purse, I mean on the table, so I don't know how long she'd been because I was for a minute letting the door come down and listen to the song, looked on the table, came back out. Come through here, I tried actually about right here, I think it back about right here. I tried 911 again, and it was busy. 
I called 911, it was busy. So I said, good, it's not bondage. And I got back over here where I could kind of see everything. And I called 911 again, and that's when whoever said 911 and said, slow down, you're, you're breathing too hard, slow down, whatever. And what's the emergency? And I don't remember for sure why I told them something about my wife been shot. The, this guy tried to rip me off. I shot him. Uh, I think she said, did you shoot your wife or something? I don't remember what all was said. You guys will have to get the date that I don't remember. But just said that she'd been shot really bad. We needed paramedics out here. Had to hurry. She told me not to hang up the phone. Uh, asked about the guns. Was there, I think she asked about was there guns in the house. I said, yeah, there was guns in the house. Um, And I think then that's when she put me, she said, I'm gonna, uh, don't hang up. She told me two or three times not to hang up, but um, she told me don't hang up, but she said um, something about she's gonna put a paramedic or a medical person or somebody on the phone now and listen to them. And I said, Did she ask you what your address was? Yeah, I'm sure she did. It's like, I told her the address. I think maybe that's when she told me to slow down. I was, you know, I was too excited or something. What address did you give? Well, I'm assuming I gave her this one, 6517 Rancho Santa Fe Drive. Um, but, you know, I may have said it wrong. I don't know what it does. I do remember once she told me to settle down. I was um, too excited or something. And anyway, the paramedic got on the phone and he says, so what's, what's happened with your wife or describe your wife or whatever, something to that effect. And I said, well, she's been shot. She's bleeding a lot around the, she's on her belly. Uh, she's bleeding a lot underneath her head. I don't, I don't remember exactly, but I described basically whatever was going on with her. And that's what I remember. She was bleeding under her head and that's what I said. And I told him I had taken a pulse and I couldn't get a pulse. And he said, you've already taken one. And I said, yeah. And I, I believe that's what happened. He asked me and I said, yes. And um, he says, okay, now listen close. We've got, this isn't going to be, he was basically telling me it was going to be yucky. And I don't remember the words he used, but he said that we needed to take care of Sharon or she was going to die. And it wasn't going to be pleasant, is maybe what he said. And I said, that's, that's, that's okay, I can do it. Let's just do what we gotta do. And so he told me to roll her over, and I went over and, um, like I said, I had this phone still. So that's what he said, keep the phone by you. And I went over, and um, it seems like he told me to lay the phone down now and roll her over. So he said, we keep the phone by me, don't hang up. But I got down like this, to, ah. Now this is the back part, and it was bad then, but it's really bad tonight, so it may not be exactly like that. But I laid the phone down, something like that. I said, Sharon, Sharon. I'm trying to get her to, to respond in some way. And told him that she wasn't responding, and he says, you're going to have to roll her over and do the chest compressions. And I says, okay, and so I tried to roll her over several times, and I couldn't get her over. She just was too, it was just too much weight for me. It was her, and I remember grunting and trying to get her over, and uh, I told the guy, I got it back on the phone, I told him, it seems like I told him, I can't get her over. I said, because she's... She's just too big. And then I says, wow, this is really freaking me out. I says, I, I don't think I can do this. I says, the other guy is, is just down in the hall, and he's got a gun, and he shot my wife. He tried to fight, shoot me, or I think he said shoot me, but he might have said fight with me. Tried to shoot me, and he's just laying in the garage for all I know. He could get up any time and, and shoot me again. And the guy says, okay, let's take care of that. He says, get up. He says, you've got your gun. I said, yeah. 
He says, okay, get your gun, get up very slowly, walk toward the man. I think he told me not to hang up. And I know when I started to get up, I pushed like that, because I remember I left the blood thing somewhere right here, trying to balance myself to get up. And I got up, got around Sharon. Excuse me, and I had it either in my pocket, in my belt loop, something. I took the gun, kept looking back. i tell you what, too, at about this time, and I did not tell you that, but about this time, I got anointed, and I went in the shower, and I just went like, like that, and backed off. Except it didn't do that, it went back in. It just kind of went, because I started thinking there was somebody in the shower. And that I didn't put in the report. I remember that later and was going to call you, but I didn't. And go back down the hall. And the guy's talking. I'm trying to light because it went off. And he's laying. He's laying right here. The hood. I don't think the car was this far up. I think the car was a little bit further back. But he was laying. Yeah, it was definitely further. I park all the way over. When I park, all the way over against the edge, because if you don't, you can't get out. And my car will stop right there, so I can get out where those buckets, where those, uh, that JVC thing is. That's as far as my front end will go, and then I can get out after that. Sharon backs, or pulls in about where she's at, and we can get in. Just had a little more room that way. And that night, the car was a little bit further back. The truck was a little further, I think, this way, and maybe a little further back. But anyway, he's laying right here, and he had on a sweatshirt, and I think he still had on the gloves, as far as I remember. But I do remember the ski mask was right up here by one of his hands, sort of, or by up here somewhere. And there was um, sacks like this. And he got in the car, there was sacks that was in the trunk that he was, because he said he had a date. And my briefcase was in the trunk. It was one of the last things I did before I leave was get my briefcase out of the trunk and throw it in the back of Sharon's car. I always lift the um, seat up, stick the bag underneath the seat and then close the seat down so nobody can see it. Because apparently somebody else stole my bag with my medicine and my money in it. And I'm talking to the guy, and I said, I don't see the gun. I says, there's some bags of stuff here. I says, there's my bag. I says, I, I, I'm in the bags, and he's got one of my bags. And it's the bag that is in there on the living room table. That, uh, I think it's a Walmart bag. And he says, well, find the gun. It has to be in there. And I remember reaching into the bag and feeling around and I stuck my finger. And there wasn't, I didn't feel a gun in there. Like I said, this was a little further back because I went around over here and I'm still keeping a pretty good eye on him. I walked around back in here and had room to get through there looking for the gun. And that's when I seen the fire extinguisher up under the tire and realized, I mean, the, where the funniest things pop into your head. But I realized I just shot this guy two times because the fire extinguisher fell down. But that's just how it happened. And I went over here looking to see if I could see the gun. And about that time, the timer went off on the, on the uh, garage door. And it just went black in here. And it just scared the living hell out of me. So I got back about, about right here. I just kind of stepped real big because I knew he was over there. And turned the door back on, turned back around, told him I couldn't find it. He told me it has to be there. If he had a gun, it has to be there. Um, carefully roll him over and see if it's there. Or something about rolling him over. And I just put my foot on him and up on the shoulder and kind of pushed on him. And he kind of tilted that way. And when he did, then he kind of went like this. And I reached down right here. Let's see, if he was laying this way, it would have been this hand. It would have been this hand. Because he was laying... He was laying something like this on his head when I 
pushed him over, and his hand dropped down, and it was right here under this hand. It wasn't, he wasn't holding it, but it was in, his hand was right by it. He was holding it, I'm assuming, but he wasn't holding it then. And I picked this up by the, I picked it up by the, I think by the, by the wood part on it, and brought it in here, told the guy he got the gun, he said, throw it, put it somewhere uh, in another room where it's safe, and lock the door. So I locked the door, said, this is a lot faster. This all is just going really fast. And I remember seeing, uh, uh, I'm assuming, uh, I'm assuming it's these things. And this has been moved, because I don't even remember if this was in here or not. I know it wasn't over there, I'm sure. But it was either here or laying on here. I think it was on here. And I threw the gun. I got just about to right here. And I just threw the gun like that. I don't remember if it stayed up on the top, if it fell down on the garbage can. But I was done with it for then. I went back down in here to my wife, got back to where I was at, uh, told him everything was cool, <clears throat> got back down here, and um, shook Sharon again, talked for a minute, and I said, she's still not moving, but she's bleeding really, really bad, and he says, that's why you've got it, she's going to die if you don't do this now. So I'm not going to be unpleasant. He says, I put down the phone and roll her over and then tell, talk to me. So I remember from CPR and stuff that she had to do the counterweights or whatever. So I, it seems like I lifted this arm, kind of lifted her up and pulled this arm under and one of these knees sort of over. And kind of, I, I just had to jerk her. There wasn't, I mean, it wasn't like a, a gentle, loving thing by any means. It was like, and about the third time it jerked enough that she got up kind of straight up and I could just kind of push her over. And she came over and it was the, the grossest thing I had ever seen in my life. And my wife that died of a heart defect uh, was pretty gross, but um, just really thick, blobby stuff coming out of the mouth, and I don't know if it was blood, I don't know if it was some type of, of matter, and I remember the, the box was under here, and it was slick, and I tried to push the box like that back, trying to get the leverage, and there was the other gun, another gun laying right here, and I picked it up, and I don't know why for sure that I, I was going to check it to uh, see if it was loaded. I don't know why, because I know guns better than this. I don't know revolver that much, but I pushed the revolver, the, um, the button of the cylinder drops open. And I'm thinking of like a safety button or something. But anyway, I just pushed it, and I could see that the cylinder was starting to come open. So I just closed it back and just threw it back, just dropped it right there, and started doing the chest compulsions, compressions. Got him on the phone, told him what was told him what was going on. Uh, I reached across like this, took her pulse one more time, uh, no pulse, and um, pulled her blouse up. And I went up from the, from the sternum or whatever is the way I was taught to do it. And I went up to where the sternum is and then put my you go up one fist up and then one fist over it. And I know the whole time I'm, I'm probably crying and yelling, Sharon, God damn it, fuck, fuck, Sharon, fuck, talk to me, something like that. And um, I'm doing the correct chest compressions, and then I kind of thought, maybe I'm not doing these right, I'm kind of doing them like a wild man. So then I started, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, and I'm really just getting tired, I'm getting... And every time I pushed on them, blood just oozed out. Just oozed out. 
And I did that for, it doesn't seem like it was very long, maybe 10, 20 compressions on my own, and then maybe 15 where I was counting, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000. And um, um, I told the guy, I said, you know, I got a bad back, and bad neck, and I said, I just don't got too much left in me. And he says, the police are here, go let them in the front door. Just go let them in the front door. And I got up, and I went and let the police in the front door. Yeah, I don't remember what I did with the phone. And I just came right in here. And I was weird about the door, and this I do not remember for sure. But it, it's, it seems like when I undid the door that, that I did it all right. I looked to make sure the buzzer was off, and then I realized it was too dark, so I turned all these lights on um, and turned them off again to make sure I had all the right ones, because one of them works the floodlight, one of them works this light, and one of them works... Um, the porch light. But anyway, I turned the line off again, make sure I had them right, and I unlocked the doors, got to the, got to, and by then the cops are yelling, put your hands up, whatever, and I think they must have had some type of lights or something, maybe just car lights, but it was really bright in here. And I did the same thing on this. But it was like I locked the door instead of unlocking it. So then I had to go back and do it again to come out. And that's the only thing really weird I remember is that I thought that I had unlocked the door and it seems like I locked them and then unlocked them. And that don't make any sense to me because they should have just been unlocked. I mean, it should have been, I should have just unlocked them once rather than, it's, and I may have only done it once. It may just be my mind. But in my mind, it seems weird to me. It seems like I locked them rather than unlocked them. And then I just went outside and cops grabbed me and just took me down, took my money, took my clip, took my gun, uh, took my little pill bottle thing, uh, took my keys, took everything I had in my pocket. They didn't check my shoes, didn't check... Um, I was just going to say, because this camera started to tweak me out. Um, I wasn't planning on camping out in there. I was just getting them and going. We switched tapes. Now we're on tape two. Uh, and we're just going to go through some, some clarifying questions um, to get real specific about what you're dealing with. Um, you said that you had gone into the room and you took the gun from the shoe rack that's hanging in the closet. And a clip. And a clip. And you put the clip in your pocket. And then when you were coming, you started to come out? The, I did come out. Okay, we are actually not passing all the way out. About right here, about right here. Okay, so you're in the doorway. And he's coming right by. Okay, and he started towards you. How far back into the room do you think that you went? Well, I went to right here to the door. No, I just, when I came in here like this, decided, okay, I thought I'd seen something right there. I just went just like that. God it in there and came back right about that, about where he is. Not even closer. I'll be here. Okay. Okay, and then he then comes in twice. You know, like I'm facing you now? Uh, he's more like going out, but he's, he's, looking, uh, he's looking at him.
just when I came in here like this, decided, okay, I thought I'd seen something right here. I just went just like that. God had stuck it in there and came back right about that, about right then. He's about right where he is. Okay, so he's standing right, right here. Right uh, even closer, about where they, about here. Okay. Okay, and then he just kind of comes in before I come out. Like I'm facing you now? Uh, he's more like going out, but he's, he's, look, uh, he's, he's looking at me. Okay. He's looking at me. But he's, he, he's making his motion to work towards the door. I don't know if he's making his toward the door or more toward just coming around this way. I'm just saying he wasn't back that far. He was about right here. Okay, he's back here, and, and he's going towards the garage door. He's, I don't know if he's going toward the garage door. He's just going to right here, as far as I know, because that's where we met. Just if you could, not, not me doing it, if you could explain his actions for me, if you could just kind of show what you remember him doing. He just came up, this, just coming up right up here. Well, he's just about right here. And I don't know what he was doing. I don't know what he's doing, because I just turned around and got this and turned around, and like, there he was. Why, there he was. Not what was in his head? What was he physically doing? What was? What were his movements that you remember? Just, just about. Well, that was about it. He just walking like this. And he knew, I, I think he knew I went in there. I don't know if he's seen me go in there or what. Okay. But what he did. You see him do it. You could just repeat his movements. It's like that. It's kind of. So he stepped in the doorway and squared off on you? Kind of, yeah. Okay. More of a, about there, about right. there. So now, he's he's not, maybe about right there. there. He was, he was looking for, first, I thought he was looking at something, but I guess he was just looking through me. You guys are just a few inches away from each other. Just a few inches away, and he's, he's going, I got, I had just come down with the gun, and I, you can see my gun, I had the gun. Okay. And he's doing, he's doing for something, I don't know what he's doing. He's either getting a gun or going to stop me because it gives him something to his pants. He's facing this way. He's got both hands or just one? Mm, think just one, but I don't know for sure. Mm. It's stamped in your memory, and I'm sure that you're never going to forget it. his hand. He was digging him because I was thinking I could probably hit him. I think it was his hand here he was digging with. Well, he had both hands down because one yeah, hand hands, it looks like one his hand was, was like his, this hand. Okay. And then came up with and cut the other hand up like a like a defensive move almost. He did? Yeah. And, well, he was just getting it up. I don't know if he was going to push me or what. It's about the same. I don't know that anything was said. There was something said like, fuck you, or oh fuck, or fuck this, because I remember saying uh, fuck a few times. Um, fucking come in my house, or something like that, or something. I just, you know, just shit. Did he say anything to you? I, I don't remember. I don't think he did. I don't think he did. He steps up in here and then he turns and he squares off against you and then he, what do you do? He just, just about like that. That's it. That's it. Then, then he moves on down here. Moves on down here. He didn't he didn't turn nope, in on you? Nope, he didn't come in on me. He just well, maybe a little bit on me. But not like not like we was gonna fight. He was more and you know what happened? When we came in like this, you sort of like this, when we came out like this, I don't know if he was because he's looking for his stuff, and then with this hand came up, and I thought he was going to push me, but I think what he did is did the mask, because somehow it seems like maybe his mask came up a little bit. All right, so he his own right arm and, and takes I, I don't know that for sure. I'm just trying to just come around, but I remember we just, we may have just touched here, just touched here a little tiny bit. When was, where was he in relation to you when you fired the first time? Maybe right there. So he's, now is he going? No, he's turning toward me still. He's Is still. How's he doing? Nope, he's still trying to dig. He's still digging out. He's just like this, just digging out. And I'm kind of coming. I'm, I'm just coming at him. I'm going to shoot him. Okay. There's he's no. He's coming here and he squared off on you. How did he get there? He seen me then. He just turned around and just, just kind of. No, no, he wasn't running. He was backing the whole time. So, <laughs> okay. You know, keeping an eye on me. He's, yeah, kind of. He's keeping an eye on me. He's keeping an eye on me. See where I'm going. Yeah. So now he's gotten over to here and he's still squared off against you? Pretty close, pretty close, I think. I, I just started shooting. 
I just started shooting. Yeah. I just started to shoot. I don't know if I fired the first shot. I just shot. Straight up? Turn on you? Don't know. Don't know. He's just, he's, I think he's still facing me. I think he's still facing me. He might have been a little more. Reason? No, no, I don't think so. I think that he may have had, I may have already shot him when he put the gun up. But he's more maybe kind of like that. Like that. Seems, like, seems like it was like that because it was just like, it was close. It was pretty close. Might have been a little further back. Might have been a little further back. Yeah. And then he was headed toward the door. And that was it. Yeah. All right. So show, show me his movement from the time that he came up here and back here. Where you first, where you first see him. Show me what you saw him do. Oh, back here. Sharon, oh, I have the door. Yeah, I did. I stood here from this Sharon. Called at her a couple of times. And I actually started, like I told you, I pushed the garage and then stopped it because I was actually going to go get the neighbors. Oh. And I thought, you chicken shit, go see what's wrong with your wife. And I closed the door back down and, and then did, did just like that. Okay. Came up here and about right here, I just thought, no, this ain't cool. And started going in to get the gun. And like I said, just as I started to go in here, I don't know if he went in, if he came out, if he jumped across, because it was just out of the corner of my eye. But I think he was hiding. I think he was in that bedroom, and he just stuck his eye out enough, and I could just see him. In the drum room, yeah. I think so. Just enough that I could see him, and just out of the corner of my eye. And that's what I, I just got scared. I just got scared, and I said, fuck it, I know there's a gun in there. And I thought, there just... Grabbed it, turned around, he was coming down. I think he was running. I think he was probably going to run away. And we, yeah, and right around in here somewhere, we actually kind of bumped into each other just for a split second. Okay, but he's, if he's running, if he's running towards that open door. Well, yeah, I don't know. He was going toward the door as much as maybe he was coming toward me. Okay. So show me what you saw from the, from the moment you could see him. After you get the gun. I almost ran into him. him. I almost ran into right, him. Right, right. Okay, he's right. coming down here and... And it's like he was looking to see if I was in there for sure. I don't know if he was like thinking maybe I'm just standing here waiting to pop him if he goes by. But he is kind of like just, man, just like this. And I was right up on him. Okay, right up on him. Actually, actually, I came forward. I came forward a little bit because we made contact. But that's when I bit the side of my mouth. I thought I hit the door or something. But it was just from contact. I, I might even have maybe, maybe I might have pushed his mask up because I'm taller. When we came in here, well, but it just pushing it down. Though he's short. Pardon me. You'd be pushing it down, not up, right? Well, I'd be pushing it kind of sideways. I wasn't like knocking it off or anything with my hands. I think just body movement. All right, Tom. And if you I'm thinking you, maybe it caught his vision. For me, you've gone into the room. You retrieved the gun. You're coming back out. Show me his movement from the time you see him until the time he goes down. Repeat that for me. You actually do that movement. Okay, I'm coming out about the same time too, and about right here, we hit, and he's coming, okay. he's coming down just like this. You see him, he's there, he stares right. off on you. But, yeah, kind of, okay. kind of. Okay. Then what happens? Um, him, just his movement, not yours. But kind of like that, I was already shooting, I was already shooting. Okay, so, was already so, shooting. When, you, so when you first fire, he's right in this area. Yeah, so probably, maybe, maybe a little more that way, maybe a little more this way. Because okay. I kind of just... Where do you think he hit him? Probably, maybe in the arm or the chest. Unfortunately, I don't think I hit him because he just kept okay. going. Okay, so after you fired the first time, does he stay squared off on you? No, no, he no, he's, he, he's going. Okay. And I'm shooting the whole time. Seems like maybe about right here, he actually gets turned away from me. Okay. So you fire the first time, you know, he's stepping. Go ahead, go ahead and repeat, repeat his movements for me, whatever you remember. Whatever we're doing is from here. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I hit him. I don't know if that's when he got his gun out. If he just said, fuck it, I'm running. I don't know what it was. It seems like I shot him again, maybe like about right here. And then he started turning like this toward the door. And I just, I did, I, oh, I shot, I shot, and shot, and shot, and shot. I may have emptied the gun, I don't know. How many times do you think you fired before you got to the door? As right. many times as I could. I don't know. How many times do you think? 
I think the gun holds eight, never had one in the chamber. Um, That's nine. It's nine, and I don't remember it staying open, so it had to be eight or less. Okay. But So then what happens after he's now? Now he's squared off against you. You fired the first round. I fired once or twice, fired again. And, and as he's going out the door, I'm, fired I'm firing and firing. Okay, and then he's he, down right he, Yeah, right he is. Uh, by then, I'm, I'm here, and he's down. He's down, laying, falling, or laying down. I don't know. Uh, I think he does, because when I, well, maybe on the shoulder, but kind of his head turned down. From somewhere on his uh, right side, you're showing? <sighs> kind of like. <sighs> kind of under his hand, but. Like that, but laying down. Because the car was for the back and he's small. Did you flip him over? Yeah, I, I pushed him over here with my foot. Right, so he's mostly on the right side and you pushed him further over? Right, to find the gun when the guy told me to. But I shot him before that again. I shot him before that again. Okay. I was standing right around, probably about right here. Okay. And then this is all almost the same continuous motion. I'd already shot him. And was coming up and, and he was down and kind of, you know, doing whatever you do as you go down. And about that time, I just, it's okay, kind of scary. Uh, about that time, uh, I had stopped shooting for a minute because I thought that's it, you know, he's, he's done. And about that time that the light went off, it was up. And that was the, that was the door. That, that, uh, <sighs> Fire extinguisher sits over here. I think the fan sits up. I mean, with this fire extinguisher, when I remember seeing it, was under my car like that. But my car was further down. But the, the fire extinguisher fell, and that's what the noise was. Fired two more times from the threshold. One or twice, I can't remember. Oh, okay. Once or twice, and I was still in here. And I. He's laying, he's laying head that way. Uh, almost head, almost head and body kind of this way and his legs over here, one hand there. And okay. That's so about it. His, um, no, wait, wait, his hand would have been up underneath here. So he was kind of laying like this and laying like this before, at first. And when the noise came down, I shot one or two times um, along here. Okay. Um, it may have been once, it may have been twice. Where'd you hit him then? Pardon me? Where'd you hit him? Uh, I shot him as... I shot him in the head. Shot him in the head. Shot him in the head. In the head? I think so, yeah. Okay. In the head or in the, up in the back here, somewhere through here. So you're saying about that? You're saying about uh, I think so. I, 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 somewhere around in here. So you can see his head at that point? You can I see his it. face? How was his head in relation to the floor? Was it facing out at the floor? Was it facing out towards you? Was it facing out to the side, to the west? It was kind of facing this way. Okay. It's kind of down. More or less down. Yeah. So you probably had And I don't think, I don't think, let me think here. You probably hit him in the back of the head? Did you tell it was Mike yet? I knew it was Mike, uh, because um, of his chin, but I don't know if he had his mask on him. It seems like he still had his mask on him. It happened really fast. I don't know. But well, it seems like mask on you were, when you yeah, he had it, right? yeah, he had his mask on there for sure. But I know when I came out, his mask was over here. I think. I don't know. I ain't gonna say that either because that may have been some of the shit he got out of the house that was there. I don't know. I don't know. So I, I really don't know. I was scared. Well, when you're back here. When you're back here and you squared off on you still had his mask on? Yeah. Okay. But it was it I think when we ran into each other, I think maybe it tilted a little bit. And I think that's what he was trying to do with his other right. arm. Was it will see. Because okay. he was kinda of acting like he didn't know what he was doing. And I just think that's scared. But then I started thinking he may not have been able to actually see out of out of where he did see. Okay. Just out of, just out of the eye holes or whatever. Okay. Then when he went between, between him now turning and you continuing to shoot and him going to the ground, he's still got his mask on. I think so. I think so. 
Because you couldn't tell who he was yet. I do. When he's facing you here in the hallway, if, if he had his mask off, you'd have known it was Mike, right? Oh, yeah. I was still shocked. I was still shocked. It wouldn't matter a bit. But, um... I don't, I really don't know. Um, I really don't okay. know. So then, after that, after he goes down, you stand here the fire extinguisher falls and you shoot him, you shoot him. There's kind of a reflex, we will. In the head. I think, yeah. Just kind of, kind of the bigger area up in there because he was kind of crunched up. And I walked around in there and tried to stay out of the blood and stuff because the guy told me to find the gun. He didn't have anything in his hands, right? In his hands? Right. Did he have anything in his hands here? No, he was, uh, he was going for something in his hands. Oh, yeah, his, I don't know if he was going in his... In his the pocket? Yeah, he had on sweatshirts with pockets. I don't know if it was one of those that go all the way through, if it's one that just had two pockets that zippers up. Um, he wouldn't carry anything. No, he didn't have anything in his hands. He was going for something in his, either in his pant loops, in his pocket, down in his pants, um, something, okay. you know. So the, I wasn't, I wasn't really paying attention to what he was grabbing at. I was paying attention to killing him. Okay. But the, the so the bag and stuff that was already out here. The bag of jewelry and everything was already out here on the ground. Yes, yes. With the grocery bag that had his clothes in. I guess it had his clothes in, but I don't know if that earlier was... Earlier in the day he saw him. Yeah, earlier in the day, yes. He had, he had date. He said he had date. Okay. He had date because he wanted to borrow more money again. And when you, when you dropped him off on Rancho, was he wearing that sweatshirt? Remember him wearing the sweatshirt and the pants with the bleach stains on them and the cowboy boots that your, that your wife gave to him? No, uh -huh. You wouldn't wear those? Uh -huh. That's uh -huh. what you wear? Uh, I can tell you, he'll tell you what he was wearing as the guy at um, the cows and pee place that sells motorcycles and um, skews because they spend a lot of time with us. They spend a lot of time with us. The guy? Oh, the salesman. Oh, during while you guys were there? Yeah. Okay. He spent a lot of time with us. I shot him, I shot at him a bunch of times. I don't know if I, how many times I hit him or what, but it was pretty close. Okay. Yeah, especially these first ones, right? Yeah. You don't have it tucked in, you have it set, set forward, you're probably inches away, right? Um, I think, it seems like on the first one, I kind of almost stood back a little bit, but I'm, again, I'm just not sure. On um, your wife, when you came back over here and you knelt down beside her here, uh -huh. you, you had to lift her up and pull her arm up, up underneath her to get her to flip over? So yeah, sort of, sort of. So it's, you're kind of grabbing her, you're reaching and getting her right arm underneath her and then flipping her under. I think I was lifting more by her shirt and her leg, like, like with the material in her leg, to get her up. And I only got her up, and then I kind of just balanced against her, and then pulled again on that shirt. It wasn't, it wasn't a lift of any kind. Where was her hand in relationship? Right there, right here. Right here. So just like maybe five or six inches inside? Yeah. He didn't pull her this way? No. But she's just too heavy. Did you, ever, did you ever lift her up and then drop her? No. There was a point where you stood strapped over the top of her and lifted her up and then dropped her back down? No. Okay. I mean, trying, trying to drop no, her over no, or trying no, to lift no, her up? No, no, no. And when you first came in the door and you saw her, was that any movement? Did you see her moving at all? I think it did, like maybe like like her body, like funny heart rates, but I mean funny. And I thought she hurt her hip. She had been playing with her hip had been catching. 
She wears these patches on her hip, and she'd been playing with her hip cock, and I thought maybe she... And I'll tell you what else, too. It drives me crazy, and I'd love for her to do it right now. But she will leave six or seven pair of shoes out. I don't know how many times I've hurt my back getting up in the middle of the night trying to be quiet because I don't sleep at nights. And all of a sudden it's... <coughs> Motherfuck! Sharon Jesus! And she'll have six or five, seven pair of shoes out. Just, it's like she booby traps the place. And, and that's what I thought. Maybe she had tripped over her own shoes and fallen. These carpets do you keep in each room, how are they normally? Do you keep them like that? Or are they usually squared off like when you step into the room? I do, but Sharon that moves them. I don't do them the way she does. Why, she, why does she move them? You know? I mean, would you expect that, that this thing to be turned and squared off to the, to the entrance of the room? I couldn't. <sighs> I figure it's so they don't catch here and so some of the dirt catches out here, but she pushes them back just like that. It's so flat. And this one, and this one always goes, they always do. I don't know why, but they always do. Every single one of them does. Do you ever buy anything out of that? Under the carpets, huh? No. And this, uh, the 38 revolver, you keep where? Can you show that? This is down. Matter of fact, I don't know who closed this. When you came in, it was down? This is down today. I want to ask my brother if he closed that, that kind of tweaks me a little bit too. Or maybe Mike or Colleen did it when they was in here, but I didn't think they got in this far. But that's where it says. And the reason he knew it was here is because you see this Sharon had part of her disability is due to she can't see well. And one of the times we was fighting and I decided I was leaving. Um, she says, fuck it, I'll just paint the house and get a renter. And uh, apparently she just went gung ho and decided to paint that day. And there's two or three places here and over here and over here and there's some of the other room that don't match. And Mike was needing some money and I said, Mike, I just don't, you know, can't loan you no more, I don't have anything else for you for a while. And he says, how about if I could paint, man? I could paint these off and hell, I could be done in 15, 20 minutes. And he, and he went up there like this to show me and I didn't have these two in at the time, I just had the one in. And when he was showing me, it pushed over and went on an angle and popped open. Oh, now I know where you keep that one. But he didn't really work anyway, because we went shooting or tried to go shooting a couple of times. So you already uh, know where it was? Yeah, I think he, I don't think he was super attempting me. And I don't know about the doors, if he did that, if the cops did that, I don't know who did that. I mean, I know we put him up there a little nicer, but it wasn't like that when we went through. Or we didn't close it down in my back, sir. From, from the time you parked the car, <coughs> all this happened pretty, pretty quickly. Did you open up the door, you called to Sharon to see what was going on, she doesn't move, and you stepped in, and then when you got near the door, you saw some movement, so you stepped in, grabbed the gun, and then as soon as you get back out, he's, he's right adjacent to the door already. And you have you square off and have a confrontation. You shoot, boom, 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 boom. He goes to the ground. Fire extinguisher falls, and you end up firing for a short time. Yeah. And then after that, you come back over and check on Sharon. I, I, clear the I, rest of the house. I cleared the rest of the house, sort of. Not, okay. Not okay, a quick check, to make sure. Not, not like you guys, did. not like LP, but. Uh, Metro did. My God, it should have been shot in the toe. She bled to death. Okay, so I, I don't understand that still. It took then, forever to come from okay, here. So then, you come, then you come over here and you kneel down by, beside her and you check on her and you go call 911? Or did you act right after you get down with the shooting to call 911? 
as soon as I got them, as soon as he was down, I came and checked on her and checked her pulse, tried to move her, and then I could see that the blood was really, really bad. And went and called 911, I tried to, and that's when I thought the bondage was down, because it goes down a lot. How, how long do you think it took you to get up with the bondage hole? I, I, I was checking, um, before I did the bondage, before I checked her, I was kind of checking these rooms out a little bit for, to see if there was anybody else in them. And, That's before you called 911? Yeah, and that was maybe 30, 40 seconds, maybe a minute. Okay. And, Did you want to get out to her quick? So you to yes, I, I, yeah, I, uh, how, seen, long, how long do you think? It took you to get a hold of mine. I didn't get a hold of mine. I got a hold of mine. Get through one of mine. Um, two minutes, because it was busy and then it, then it ran through and she, then she got me. Okay. But, um, so all told, how long do you think it took from the time you opened the door to you being on 911? You had mentioned before you thought it was a lot quicker than obviously walking through. <coughs> Two, three minutes, maybe. Two, three minutes, maybe. Because yeah. yeah. I wasn't too concerned about the the, um, the kids' room, because I could see all of it. Um, and I'm thinking that the green light was on, because it seems like I could see the light coming through the, behind the door on the couch. You know, exactly. you're going to get the phone. Yeah, I'm, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, is I'm going to get the phone. There's nothing in the living room. Once I come around the corner, there's no place to hide. In the living room. Uh, when I went in the other living room, you know, places, and that's where I sleep, because my back is on that couch. And there's a green floodlight that comes on at 8 30. And I think I'm seeing that green floodlight, and if there had been anybody hanging up there, I mean, standing up in that corner, would have been able to see the light. So I don't even think I went in there. I think I just maybe pulled the door, pushed the door to see if it. Two, three minutes Yeah. And a lot of that was just waiting for them. Waiting for them to answer, waiting for them to uh, to uh, react to it. Yeah, you took that, that out of the way you were talking about a minute. Huh. Well, you took that bondage problem and getting through the 911. We're talking about how long it took you to It's quick. Did you tell me? Two minutes, maybe. Two minutes. Two minutes from the time you opened the door to the time you were trying to call 911. <coughs> Might have been a little longer than that because I checked Sharon. I tried to start doing Sharon as soon as I knew Mike was down. There was nobody else in this immediate area, and then it dawned on me that I don't care how good CPR she's hurt because yeah, when I tried to turn her over, just blood just oozed out, and then I did the 911 thing, and that took a couple of minutes, but it, it wasn't very long. It wasn't very long. We have. Um uh, senior crime, crime scene analyst here, uh, Brandon Fail. And what, what we're wanting to do is these spots are more pronounced on the walls now because it's been a little bit of time and they spread out a little bit. Do you want to break down your own? He has a bridge. to take our lunch recess. During this recess, you must not discuss or communicate with anyone, including fellow jurors, in any way regarding this case or its merits, either by voice, phone, email, text, internet, or other means of communication or social media. You must not read, watch, listen to news or media accounts or commentary about this case. You must not do any research, such as consulting dictionaries, using the internet, or using weapons materials. 
you must not make any investigation, test the theory of the case, recreate the aspect of the case, or any other way investigate or learn about the case on your own. You must not form a trustee of the team regarding this case or the spines of the Vision on this 12.30, we will be in recess until 1.45. All rise for the jury.
I'll rise for the jury. Seated, you're out of the jury's office and kind of. We are back on the record in C250966, David Adler's Thomas Randolph. Me the record click, Mr. Randolph is present with his attorney, Deputy District Attorneys, on behalf of the state. We both participate to the presence of our jury. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. State, you may recall Detective Mom. Ms. Murphy, you are still on the jury. Thank you. Thank 
just reminding you that you are still under oath. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Ms. Marker, you're under oath. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Detective Mogg, I think we left off um, at the end of the walkthrough. At that point, Mr. Randolph um, left uh, the Rancho Santa Fe residence with his brother. I believe so. Okay. And then um, homicide detectives left whenever they left? Yes. Um, I think you uh, alluded to this, but there was possibly some further processing of the residents um, with the crime scene analyst that night? There was. Okay. Um, I want to sort of shift gears here. Um, if, if How many witnesses and victims do you think you've um, interviewed over the course of your career? Estimate. I don't have a clue. Uh, probably thousands. Has any of any of those people ever reported receiving a busy signal on 911? Judge, I'd object to this. I, I, I object. He's not qualified to, to give a discussion about that, uh, to provide an answer or an opinion about 911. It's not an opinion. I'm just asking about his experience as interviewing victims and witnesses. Well, I mean, he can testify to his experience as a police officer, but we had the Lumens person here yesterday in regards to the 911. I'm going to sustain that objection. Have you, have you ever had anyone report hearing a busy signal? No. In the, um, in the residence, did you um, take note of where there appeared to be like landline phones in the residence? I did. And can you give us the approximate locations of those? There was one in the kitchen dining room area, I believe. There was one in the master bedroom. Uh, and I believe there was one in the office area. Okay, the uh, place where he got the gun, that little room right to the left when you go in through the garage? That's correct. Okay. Um, during uh, the... Either the, well, actually, I should say this. On the first night, um, were you called upon to move a vehicle out of the garage? I was. Which vehicle was that? The Hyundai, I believe it's a Santa Fe, the SUV that Mr. Randolph was driving. And what was, what was the reason why uh, that vehicle needed to be moved on the 8th through the 9th? I believe they needed to do some more processing in there and photographs and that, and they asked me if I would back it out. When you backed out the vehicle, did you notice whether or not music was playing loud? I didn't notice that it was overly loud. Okay. Um, during Mr. Randolph's interview, um, he indicated that um, from the <clears throat> dinner they, at the charcoal room that he and Sharon Randolph went to a gas station before they proceeded home? That's correct. Um, did you do anything in order to verify or secure the sort of the timing information on that? I did. On uh, May 13th, I went to the Funnies gas station, met with management. They provided me surveillance video of their gas pumps. Um, I reviewed that video. Okay. How did you know what video to ask for? Like, how did you track it to the transaction? We looked for a timeline and then also for Mr. Randolph's vehicle arriving. Okay. And um, did you, like, verify it with, um, like, a particular transaction at a particular pump? Yes. Okay. Um, and that video was collected by you? It was. Your Honor, at this time, the state would move to admit and publish um, 315. Objection to 315? No, Your Honor. Does that appear to be the Randolph vehicle at the pump? I believe that's his vehicle at the pumps. side of the, the frame of the sort of surveillance, there appears to be a lighter colored SUV that just pulled up. That's correct. <coughs> the Randolph vehicle? Yes. Your Honor, if 
we could just get clarification for the record. I think he's wrongfully identified the vehicle. Is that accurate? It's this vehicle, the lighter colored one. The other one wasn't wearing the correct clothing. Right now, it appears to be pulling away. Detective, um, did you drive the distance from the um, that gas station to the Randolph residence? I did. And how long did that take you? <clears throat> Approximately three minutes, depending on the light cycle. Um, it's just under a mile. And um, you drove kind of the most direct route there would be, I would assume? I did. I pulled out of the gas station, drove northbound on Rancho to Rainbow, north on Rainbow to Rancho Santa Fe to Mr. Randolph's residence. Um, at some point after the... Uh, well, during the course of this investigation, were there times that Mr. Randolph would call you on the phone? Yes. Um, do you remember him calling you and um, giving you some information about Sharon Randolph and gambling? I do. What was that conversation? Uh, I believe it was May 12th that Mr. Randolph called me. I don't recall if it was on my cell phone or my desk phone. He had my card. Um, but he told me uh, that his wife, Sharon, had spent approximately $40,000 gambling in a two-year period. Do you remember him calling you um, to report other alleged missing items? I do. And what was the approximate time and content of that conversation? So that would have been June 4th, the day after the walkthrough. Mr. Randolph called me to indicate that he was missing a couple of handguns, uh, some jewelry and some silverware. Um, he kind of indicated that Mr. Miller may have been involved in those thefts. And did he actually do a subsequent call a, a little bit later, sort of retracting that? Yes. And what was that conversation? <clears throat> On June 23rd, uh, Mr. Randolph called me to say that <clears throat> um, he needed to move on from his wife's death and that um, he no longer believed that those items were stolen and didn't believe Mr. Miller was involved in that. 
Did he um, ever call you to inquire about um, life insurance? He did. <laughs> On June 27th, um, he contacted me via telephone and told me that, <clears throat> well, he asked me if the case was still open and then told me that the insurance company won't pay out until the case is closed or since the case is still open. Thank you. Your Honor, I'll pass the witness. Yes, Good afternoon, Detective. Good afternoon, Mr. Orman. Detective, uh, <clears throat> I want to ask you about that, the initial responding to this uh, scene. When you respond to a scene like this, this is a, a double homicide, there are a lot of, a lot of law enforcement personnel that respond. Fair? That's, co <clears throat> that's correct. In fact, before you got there, there would have been patrol officers that arrived? Absolutely. There would have been, what are violent crime detectives? So those are uh, detectives who, um, they have a general specialty. They'll respond to shootings, um, aggravated assault, batteries, things like that. Um, and they're there to gather the information. And if the person does not pass away, then they basically handle the case. So in this case, violent crime detectives would have been present before you showed up, before homicide showed up? I believe they were called by patrol. Okay. So approximately how many law enforcement personnel, first responders, would have entered into that crime scene? And when I say that, I mean into the garage, into the house. How many, before you did your walkthrough, how many do you think? Normally it is, <clears throat> excuse me, it would be four-ish responding officers who would go into the residence and clear the scene to make sure that it's safe for medical personnel to go in because they won't go in until police officers have cleared the residence. So probably four in the area of four initially would have went in. And then after that, um, a couple of paramedics would have gone into the residence. Then once the victims are determined to be deceased, then normally everybody backs out and they secure the scene. And when you say victims, you would agree with me, Mr. Miller's a murderer, correct? I would agree at this point, yes. Now. I realize that it's been a while, and so I'm going to ask you if you can actually give us a number for how many law enforcement personnel. I realize as you're sitting there, uh, this is going to be difficult for you. Do you think if I showed you a copy of the officer's report listing all of those officers and personnel, that would help you refresh your memory? Yes. Okay. May I approach on page two of the officer's report? Detective Maugh. Well, okay. thought maybe you had it. I do. <clears throat> um, if you could just sort of count to yourself, and maybe we could do this while I'm up here. How many officers at the top responded? So it looks like there's um, 10 officers, uh, two sergeants, and a lieutenant. Okay, so that would be 13. Correct. Okay. And then you have canine officers. That's correct. And appear to be three? Three. C detectives, when they, you say C detectives, major crime detectives? That's correct. Those would be major crime detectives. Three? Yes. Homicide detectives? Six. Could you turn the page? Crime scene analysts? Three. Coroner's investigators? Two. Mortuary personnel? Two. Paramedics? They have one listed. And it's actually written in there, entered the garage? Correct. Ambulance? Two. Okay. So fair to say, Detective, that there were quite a few uh, law enforcement personnel that entered that home at some time or another. 
No, that's not accurate. Okay, tell me why. Because there is only a certain number <clears throat> of officers who would have entered the residence. The rest of the officers are on the log because they arrived. Whether they secured the outside of the residence, um, blocked off the streets, sat with Mr. Randolph, whether they even had any part in anything other than just arriving on the scene, their names would have been put down there. Some people are just protecting the scene, making sure people don't enter. Is that fair? Correct. Okay. So leaves me to another point. You said that some of them may be interacting with Mr. Randolph. Do you remember saying that right now? Yes. In fact, prior to you arriving, there would have been officers that actually questioned Mr. Randolph, just to find out what's going on in there, that type of thing. I would assume so. I wasn't present for that, so I don't know for sure. Using the protocol that you're familiar with, do you think major crime detectives, they would have at least done a, a cursory interview of Mr. of Mr. Randolph to find out what had occurred inside? I know they would have obtained information in order to brief us. Where they got that information from, I don't know. Well, <clears throat> is it fair to say that at some of these more important scenes, that on the front of a patrol car, they'd actually use sort of a magic marker and write on the, the hood what was going on? At times they do, yes. Was that done here? I don't recall. Okay. But at some point when you arrived, you're briefed on what's sort of occurred and what you're, what you're dealing with, right? That's correct. And you were briefed, is yes. that right? And you learned that Mr. Randolph was the individual inside who said he'd shot Mr. Miller. That's correct. Okay. So it's fair to say that at the time you're being briefed, there's people who've already obtained this information from Mr. Randolph. I would assume they got some from him. Whether they got some from other witnesses in the area, I don't know. Before I uh, sort of leave this, Mr. Randolph was wearing clothing that day. We can see it. Uh, was that impounded by you? Was not. Um, after I returned back to the scene with Mr. Randolph, I told the scene detective, Detective O'Kelly, and the crime scene investigator that we needed to photograph him and take a look at his clothes. That wasn't done. And it was not done? It was not. I want to talk to you about, first of all, Mr. Randolph's statement on May 8th going into May 9th. And when I say that, you know, you can see that we're in the very late hours of May 8th going into the 9th. Correct. Okay. Mr. Randolph told you that he believed the man he shot was a man named Michael Miller. That's correct. And you, in fact, confirmed... <clears throat> that the man he shot was named Michael Miller? Yes. Mr. Randolph told you that he met Michael Miller approximately five months beforehand at a convenience store? Approximately, yes. <clears throat> and you learned that he had known him for that period of time, approximately? Yes. Mr. Randolph told you that he had hired Mr. Miller to do sort of odd jobs, sort of handyman type jobs. That's correct. And you learned that Mr. Miller, in fact, did some handyman jobs around the, uh, the Randolph home, correct? Yes, according to Mr. Randolph. Okay. Mr. Randolph told you in the interview that, in fact, Mr. Miller had at one time gone to Colleen's home, that's Sharon's daughter, and had actually done some type of handyman job one time. He told that's you. what he said. That's what he said. Mr. Randolph told you that Mr. Miller didn't have a car but normally rode a bike. Correct. <clears throat> and before I segment away from there, there was a bag of clothing recovered near Mr. Miller. Do you remember this? I do. And in fact, the pants were laid out. And there, do you remember something distinctive sort of on the side of the pants? Do you remember this? Let I recall the clothing in a bag that there was a shirt 
Uh, there was the other bag had a towel and a black bag, but I don't recall much other than that. Let, let me see if it refreshes your memory. If it doesn't, there you go. Th there appeared to be sort of a ripping or tearing on these pants that were consistent with what law enforcement thought was riding a bike from a bike chain. Do you remember this? So, or no? I don't recall that. Detective O'Kelly is the one that actually conducted the scene investigation. Okay. Mr. Randolph told you that Mr. Miller had found a key at some point and Mr. Randolph told him, give me my key back. Correct? I know that he said he found a key. I don't remember if he said, give me the key back or he gave the key back. Yes, I would agree with you. It was too strong a statement. At some point, he indicated that he received the key back from Mr. Miller. I believe that's what he said. He told you he trusted Mr. Miller, didn't he? Yes. He told you he had paid Mr. Miller and lent him money, didn't he? That's correct. And you learned that to be true or to be accurate? It's accurate. Mr. Randolph's told you that Mr. Miller, he had been driving on May 8th with Mr. Miller and he was going to go to the bank but he'd missed the turn. Didn't he tell you that? That's correct. He told you that he and Mr. Miller had gone to look at jet skis, the Kawasaki jet ski place on Rancho, didn't he? Yes. Mr. Randolph told you he had been with Mr. Miller on May 8th before the, before the incident, didn't he? Correct. <clears throat> he told you, Mr. Randolph, on May 8th, that he and Sharon had gone to the charcoal room, correct? Yes. And in order to verify that, because you wanted to verify that, you went to see if you could find video of the Randolphs at the Santa Fe. I did not go to the Santa Fe. I don't know if another detective did. You've seen video of the Randolphs leaving the Santa Fe, have you not? I have not. You have not? No. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Randolph told you after he went to the charcoal room, he went to Funny's gas, well, he, after he left the Santa Fe, they went to Funny's uh, convenience store gas station. That's correct. So you, so law enforcement went and obtained video from Funnies. I did that. And in fact, you saw the vehicle and you told the jury that's the vehicle. That's correct. Now, before I move any farther from that, detective, in the hundreds of homicides you've handled, it's fair to say that you have had to obtain video from 7-Elevens, convenience stores, gas stations, casinos, lots of different uh, sort of establishments. That's correct. A and fair to say that not all the time is the video calibrated. The time is not calibrated. That's correct. And when I say that, just I know you know what I'm asking you, but if we could just get clarification. In other words, just because you go to a 7-Eleven on Rancho and Charleston and get a, a video and it says 755 doesn't really mean if we get our Apple watch out that was the exact time. That's correct. We always try to obtain the accurate time. We either use our cell phones or our watches against the time that is depicted on the video. Would it be fair to say in this case with funnies there'd be no way to do it? In other words, you go get the video, that's the time that it says it is, right? The time we saw. No. Um, I actually would have looked at the live feed to look at the time that I picked the video up to make sure that it wasn't, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour ahead of time. How far was it off? I don't recall. I would have made note if there was a difference in time between the live feed and the actual time on my watch. But you said you didn't recall. I don't. I don't recall what the time was. Obviously on here, the time was 8.24 p.m. approximately. When I picked up the video is when I would have looked at the monitor and my phone or my watch. Okay, so you, do you note in any report the accuracy of the timing of the video? 
I did not. <clears throat> Mr. Randolph said that he drove home and that he had to let Sharon out of the vehicle because it was too tight a fit into that garage for both of them to get out. That's correct. And when you observe that, you could sort of see what he was saying. Fair to say? Yes. He told you he let her out and that then he slowly went in, uh, sort of following her to make sure she could get in the door. That's what he said. Correct. And you talked, without saying what they said, to a man named, or excuse me, you know there was a neighbor who uh, observed the timing of this named Mr. Bartlett across the street. I believe one of my partners talked to him. Okay. <clears throat> and he was actually on the phone. Do you, re do you remember that was something that you obtained with phone records? Maybe not you, but law enforcement did? I believe so. And you wanted to obtain <clears throat> that because it was important to the timeline, correct? Yes. Very important. Right? Correct. Based on what Mr. Bartlett was saying he observed, you wanted to get those phone records so you could correlate what he had seen and heard against the phone records, correct? That would be accurate, yes. Do you remember what time the uh, phone call between Mr. Bartlett and his friend, what time it started? I do not. Do you know what time it ended? I do not. Mr. Randolph told you that when he went into the house, he observed Sharon at the end of the hall and tried to describe sort of where her head was. Yes. He said it was a little bit into the master bedroom, didn't Correct. he? Correct. When we saw that walkthrough, it appeared that uh, carpet had been removed sort of where her head had, was. Did you see that? There was quite a large blood stain there, and I believe that's why the carpet was removed. Okay. And that, would that be done by hazmat? Uh, whatever company, the insurance company hired to do that. Okay, so at the time we do, you're doing the walkthrough, we know that there have been people in there cleaning up, cutting out carpet, making sure that this place is acceptable for people to go live in. There? That's correct. Mr. Randolph told you that he saw something that spooked him. Something spooked him. It could have been, he even called it floaty. Something he saw spooked him. Do you remember him saying that? Yes. Do you remember him saying that he then got a gun from the bedroom where he was near? I do. And he tells you that as he comes out, he bumps in to Mr. Miller, correct? Correct. And then he says, he sort of pushes him away to get space, right? Yes. And then he shoots him multiple times. That's correct. He doesn't know how many times, does he? I believe at one point I seem to recall him telling me that the pistol was loaded with nine and he didn't remember the slide locking to the rear, so eight or less. So he told you he'd actually shot eight or less, right? I believe so, yes. And Mr. Miller was shot five times, <clears throat> right? I didn't attend autopsy. So you just don't know how many times he was shot. That's correct. Okay. But he clearly told you, Mr. Randolph, I shot Mr. Miller. I shot that man, didn't he? Yes. He told you at one time that the mask, he says actually multiple times, he says to you and to Detective O'Kelly that something happened with the man's mask, sort of it pushed up, and he then describes maybe he couldn't see very well in it. Do you remember him saying that? Yes. And then he's asked, was the mask still on Mr. Miller when he was laying in the garage? And he specifically said, no, it was laying to the side. Do you remember him saying that? That's correct. And that's what the pictures show. It was laying to the side. Yes. Mr. Randolph says that he actually shot shots inside the garage. Didn't he tell you that? Correct. And in fact, you found cartridges in that garage, didn't you? Yes. He said that he had shot in the garage and he had shot Mr. Miller, he believed, in the head. Do you remember him saying that? That's correct. Did you see Mr. Miller's body? 
Only a cursory view of him. I didn't look close. You wouldn't dispute that Mr. Miller was shot, <clears throat> would you? I would not. He told you that he had called 911, and in fact, he did call 911, didn't he? Yes. He told you that there was no doubt in his mind that Miller was going to shoot him. Do you remember him saying that? I believe he said something to that effect. He tells you several times, he uses the word, I'm basically deaf, or words to that effect. Do you remember that? I do. Do you remember when he said, I didn't hear a first shot, I didn't hear this, I had music up and I'm basically kind of deaf. Do you remember him saying that? I do. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when he was talking in the walkthrough and he talked about how he had almost, he thought maybe Sharon had fallen over his shoes? Yes. Do you remember when he said, I wish, I, I wish he could, that could have happened right now? Do you remember him saying that? I do. Like in a loving way. Like I wish. Objection calls for speculation. Okay. During the walkthrough, page 42, Council, he's talking about how it drove him crazy how she would leave these shoes out. I, do you remember that? Yes, I do. I'm going to ask you, do you remember him saying, it drives me crazy, and I'd love for her to do it right now? I remember that. Do you remember in that first video, in the first interview, there were a couple times where Mr. Randall pauses and doesn't answer your questions right away? Yes. Do you remember Mr. Randolph saying that he thought Mr. Miller was ripping them off and he was referring to the night of the incident? I don't know if he was only referring to the night of the incident or he was speaking about other times. Do you remember in the first interview when, at the very end, you're asking you and Detective Hardy where he's going to go? Essentially, where are we going to take you? We're done. It's sort of late in the early, or it's the early morning hours of the ninth. What are we going to do with you? And he says, I don't want to stay there ever again, referring to the house. Do you remember? Yes. Do you remember when he asked you about funeral arrangements? I do. Now... During the interview, you ask him about gloves. Do you remember? Do you want to know? I think it's Detective Hardy who says, hey, there's some gloves. Do you have any gloves like that? Do you remember that? That's correct. Okay. And he sort of says, yeah, we have gloves around the house. Do you remember him saying that? Yes. Okay. So one of the things you do as an experienced homicide detective is you request forensic science, uh, forensic testing on items, right? Correct. Like, like gloves, masks, things like that. Yes. Okay. After the first interview, he took you and showed you where Mr. Miller lived? That's correct. And is in fact true? Is that, or did you learn that that's where Mr. Miller lived? It was. One thing I don't mean to nitpick, that it's not a snub nose 38. Have you seen it recently? I just, a brief glance at it, I, now that I recall it had a four inch barrel. Okay. He told you that the gun, he found this 22 underneath Mr. Miller's body. Yes. And that he had thrown it into this room, essentially, so that he could be safe and that this is also what was, he was being instructed to do in 911. I don't recall the 911 operator telling him to throw it into a room. I recall Mr. Randolph proposing that he go look for the gun and then the 911 operator, the fire department operator said, okay, go do that. Would and you? then Mr. Miller said, well, I picked up my gun. I have my gun, I think is what he said. And then he goes out <clears throat> and he's not speaking on the phone. Detective Mogg, uh, you said Mr. Miller, you meant Mr. I mean, Mr. Randolph. And so when you're saying that Mr. Randolph does that, would you you'd let the 911 uh, audio speak for itself, would you? I would.
Do you recall in a prior proceedings calling the jewelry costume jewelry? I believe so. Have you looked at that jewelry recently? Recently? Yes, sir. No, sir. You're not, without being sarcastic, you're not a jeweler. You, you have no idea, right? I am not. I only have to buy it. Okay. And some of that's pretty valuable jewelry, depending on your financial situation. Would you agree with that? Some of... The jewelry that was laid out. Have you ever seen a picture of it laid out? I have not. There are coins. Do you remember coins? What looked like gold or silver coins? I saw what was in the bag and what was in a uh, jewelry box, and it appeared you know, not high-end jewelry to me, just something that I would call costume jewelry. Okay. You told us that you went into this house and you did not see it as, uh, as ransacked. Do you recall that? I do. It's in this 160. Let me move backwards. I'm going to put on the screen what has been admitted as State's Exhibit 168. Mr. Arbor, we do that first. We will down in front, in front of the machine. This in the front. There you go. Thank you, Judge. To do it again. Yes, ma'am. Do you see, Detective, I'm going to show you, can you see that quite well? Okay. I can see the picture, yes. Do you see the coins that I'm talking about at the top left hand side of it? Do you see that? It's about four coins in a row. see the circular things. I can't tell you what they are. Okay. Do you know if there's a solid gold antique watch in there? I do not. But that, somebody says they're missing their solid gold antique watch. You, you would agree that that may be valuable? Well, obviously, a solid gold watch would be valuable. If a state's, if Colleen had told the jury that, you wouldn't have any reason to dispute it, would you? I wouldn't have any reason to dispute if somebody said a solid gold watch. Do you see a lot of, do you see a lot of gold depicted in that video? I see a lot of gold metal. Got right, and you just don't know if. Okay, let's. We can pick out anything there, and you wouldn't be able to tell me whether it was fake gold, fourteen karat gold, eight eighteen karat gold, would you? I would not. But there's a lot of jewelry there. Would you agree? Whether you want to call it costume or what, there's a lot of jewelry there. There's quite a bit, correct? You're familiar with handguns, aren't you? I am. If somebody wanted a 38 Smith & Wesson six-shot revolver, that's going to cost several hundred dollars, more than $500 today. Ooh, I don't know what the current value of a revolver is. Um, I don't believe it would cost more than $500. From Smith & Wesson, I bet it cost more. It wouldn't be less than $700, would it? You're just not sure, are you? No, I couldn't tell you how much it was, but I don't believe it would be that much. Be real easy to look up, wouldn't it? Yes. Okay. We wouldn't have to dispute it. We could just simply. That's correct. Okay. There's two of them, right? There were two of them that were involved. Two Smith and Wesson revolvers, one a 22 and one a 38, were involved in this case, right? Correct. Now you were saying that you didn't see ransacking, right? That's correct.
showed you, Smith & Wesson has a uh, website, doesn't it? You can buy a gun online. I believe so. Okay. If I showed you the current price <clears throat> of one of these things, would that help? Isn't that object? This crime occurred in 2001. He said today it wouldn't cost that much. Then I object as to relevance. I wonder how that relevance is. Okay. That's fine. That objection is sustained. You saw pictures in that house of drawers open, didn't you? Yes. You saw pictures of jewelry bo boxes on the floor. I saw empty drawers from a wall-mounted box. You saw, how many drawers did you see disturbed in that house total? Eight. Mr. Randolph told you Mr. Miller had been in that house and had done work in that house, right? That's correct. He said that he had painted this area where the, the gun, this sort of, for lack of a better word, a gun compartment was, correct? Correct. And you could see that there's some, like for lack of a better term, sort of a paint differential that looks like there's been a change of paint. That's correct. It's not very articulate, but you understand what I mean. Yes. Okay. So let's go through some of these drawers open. Now, I'm showing you State's Exhibit 117. That appears to be the master ba bedroom, doesn't it? Yes, it is. So there's one drawer open, isn't it? Correct. You could put your hand in there and pull something out, couldn't you? If you zoom in on it. Could you put your hand in there and get something out? Sure. You could be looking for money in there, couldn't you? You could. I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 105. Still the master, isn't it? Correct. Okay. And there, you see there's jewelry boxes or some type of boxes on the floor, right? Yes, there's the three drawers from the wall-mounted box, and then there's another jewelry box, for lack of a better term. How did that bed look? before the Randolphs left to go to the charcoal room? I have no idea. You don't know? You, don't, you just don't know, do you? No. I'm showing you 106, States Exhibit 106. What's that flower object down there? A door weight. Okay. And then there's three other boxes, right? Those were the three boxes that you saw from the other picture. Okay. And I'm showing you what's being marked as 110, or admitted as 110. You see those drawers open? Yes. You see something's, some type of clothing is sort of... I think you have to move it over. You have to zoom. Can you zoom out, Mr. Orr? I can. So we can see the whole clothing. Okay. See that? Clothing on the side of the drawer? I do. Fair to say, detective, that Mr. Randolph and Mrs. Randolph came home and you wouldn't dispute Mr. Miller was in there, right? No. In your experience as a police officer, burglars get caught. Sometimes they get caught, don't they? Yes. Sometimes when you're in robbery, let's say, some bank robbers get away. Fair? They, they leave the bank and they get away. That's correct. Some have shootouts in the bank. Yes. Some get caught right in the bank, don't they? That's correct. So some people get caught right in the act, They're caught right at that, at that time, right? Yes. Showing you what's marked as State's Exhibit 115, you see that sort of cabinet door uh, in the center of the picture is kind of open behind the bed. Do you see what yes. I'm, I'm showing you what's being marked and admitted as 116. 
see that in the bathroom it appears some drawers are ajar, for lack of a better term. This is one of the things that I thought was odd. Okay, I didn't ask you that. I said they're ajar, isn't it? Yes. You see in 123 some slippers sort of in the way of the door, don't you? I don't think they're in the way of the door. That's a poor question. You see them right there, the pink slippers. Correct. Not placed in the closet, but just sort of out, right? Yes. I'm showing you what's one tw being admitted as 124. You see this sort of console. Do you see that it looks like the door is just slightly ajar? Yes. Showing you what's being marked and admitted as one state's exhibit 129. That's the gun, isn't it? That's correct. That's the gun he said he was trying to throw into a garbage can. Yes, that's it. And he was saying that he actually said the suitcase wasn't there, didn't he? He said, oh, I don't think the suitcase is some kind of clothing. Do you remember that? Correct. He got it wrong, didn't he? Suitcase was there, but he told you it wasn't. Yes. Didn't he? There's no importance to that suitcase whatsoever, is there? He just, I'm sorry? There's no importance to the suitcase whatsoever. He just got it wrong, didn't he? That's correct. <laughs> Detective, when you talked to him the second time, the first and second time, he agreed to talk, didn't he? The second time being a walkthrough? Let's do it this way. The first time you talked to him, he says, you know, I, I'm going to, uh, he talks to you, right? Correct. He talks to you, answers all your questions until you're done asking questions. Yes. Okay. He doesn't <clears throat> have an attorney there. He does not. He doesn't have somebody like Mr. Tomchak there, does he? I'm sorry? He didn't have somebody like Mr. Tomchak sitting there giving him advice, right? He did not. He did a walkthrough a week later, right? Yes. He showed up with his brother. That's correct. He didn't have an attorney there with him, did he? No, sir. He tried to answer your questions, didn't he? Yes. He told you at the end of the walkthrough that he was, he was getting tired, his back was hurting. That's correct. He told you at the beginning of the video, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I just want to cooperate. Do you remember him saying that? Correct. And he did try to cooperate with you. In other words, he tried to answer your questions. He didn't say, I'm not doing this, I'm walking out of this thing, going to get an attorney. He didn't do anything like that, did he? That's correct. The doors, we saw the doors of a closet were off track, right? Yes. Okay, so why don't you tell the jury about the condition of the safe inside of that closet? I didn't conduct a crime scene investigation. That would be a question you would have to address to Detective O'Kelly. If there's a safe in a house, and there's a potential burglary, or there's been an attempted burglary, do you want to take a picture of the safe? Again, I didn't conduct the investigation of the crime scene, so the question you're going to have to ask Detective O'Kelly. Fair enough, because you're responsibility that night was to question witnesses, or excuse me, in this investigation, one of your responsibilities was to question witnesses, right? Mr. Randolph. Was that it? It wasn't to question other witnesses? That's correct. Who, who would be responsible for uh, would that be Detective O'Kelly? To have to interview other witnesses, like the Miller's family or anything like that? I believe that was Detective Long who also responded with us that night. Okay. Did you actually ever go and interview Billy and Vita Miller? I believe so. I went with, I believe, Detective O'Kelly, or I may have went with my partner. I know I interviewed other people later in the investigation, not that night. Without telling me what they said, you interviewed these people, and one of the concerns you had was looking for a mask. Right? Looking for a... Mask. Ski mask. Correct. Or a missing ski mask. See if you could find out where this mask had come from. Do you yes. remember? At the conclusion of interviewing Vita and Billy Miller, you asked for consent to search their home for, the, for a mask, didn't you? Yes. And you didn't find a mask, did you? That's correct. But having interviewed them, Vita and Billy Miller, 
you thought it would be important to look for a mask in that house, right? Correct. Because one of the masks that night when you're interviewing, or excuse me, that day when you're interviewing Vita and Billy Miller, you begin to look for a mask, but this mask has a big hole so that the mouth would show. Do you remember this? I don't recall that. Did you look carefully at the mask in this case? The, the one that was right next to Michael Miller? I did not. Again, that was Detective O'Kelly who conducted the crime scene investigation. Okay, so it wasn't something you noticed. You didn't notice whether it looked like there was, like, it was almost sort of sewed together the mouthpiece. I did not. That walkthrough. It was important to do the walkthrough so the jury could see exactly what happened, right? It was important for us to do the walkthrough with him so that we could get an idea of the dynamics inside that hallway at the time that the incident occurred, at the time that Mr. Randolph said that he shot Mr. Miller. So One thing to explain it to me, it's another for me to watch you actually reenact and show me where you're standing. Okay. How many officer-involved shootings have you ever responded to? About 75. That's a lot, isn't it? Yes, sir. Okay. And when I say officer-involved shootings, just so we all know, what, I know what you're talking about, but what we're talking about is police officer has discharged a weapon and has shot somebody, maybe it's fatal, maybe it's non-fatal, and you're responding to see why the police officer has discharged his or her weapon. Is that That's fair? correct. <clears throat> and you want to talk to the police officers because you want to find out, hey, you know, why did you discharge that weapon, right? Yes. But never have you ever videotaped or caused to be videotaped a police officer describing and doing a walkthrough on a shooting. Fair? That's not true. How many have you done? Well, I was involved in one that I actually was the person who did the walkthrough. Okay. How many, how many videos have you have, have you seen done of officers that were involved in officer-involved shootings? I'm going to take a ballpark guess here. Ten plus? Out of 75? Approximately. Were you videoed walkthroughs? Yes. Okay. Now, are you familiar with the International Association of Chief of Police? I am. Is that the <clears throat> biggest sort of organization uh, of police in the United States? Um, more like the management of police departments. And they are an organization that gives you a guide on officer-involved shootings, right? I believe they have one. I'm going to ask you some statements and see if you agree with them. An officer involved in a shooting is per perhaps the most traumatic event an officer will encounter during service. Do you agree with I that? agree. Such incidents trigger complex psychological and emotional effects. All too often, the normal coping strategies employed by individuals are inadequate for such extreme event. Do you agree with that statement? I do. Init initially, an officer involved may be dazed and upset and have feelings of disbelief. Do you disagree with that or agree? I agree. Do you agree with the statement, the officer may have difficulty comprehending the reality or significance of the cr critical incident? From a few hours to a few days later, he or she may show signs of depression, tension, agitation, irritability, and fatigue. Do you agree with that? Some do, not all. It, it, we're all human and we all uh, feel things different. There. That's true. Officers that are involved in shootings <clears throat> have different reactions. Right? Yes. Some can appear numb. Is that fair? Some. Some very agitated. I haven't seen any that were agitated. Crying. I would agree, maybe some. There is also a shock reaction period where the emotions concerning the incident become blunted. Do you agree with that? Yes. The officer may feel emotionally detached and numb, but also experience occasional anxiety attacks. Do you agree with it? I don't know that I can say that I agree with that. Okay. 
Additionally, emotional reactions may include confusion, impaired decision making, loss of judgment, and slowness of thought. Do you agree with that? And when you say that, you're referring to? Police officer involved in a shooting. After a shooting? Yes, sir. <clears throat> I don't know that I would agree with that completely. Would you agree with the statement, typically within several days of the incident, a full emotional impact of the situation is realized, though this can be delayed by as much as six months to a year or more. The officer involved will typically experience an emotional and physical letdown. Do you agree with that? I know that there are feelings that you have um, weeks, months later. Do you agree with the statement? Some of the more common reactions are fear, anxiety, anger, rage, or blaming those responsible for the outcome of the critical incident. All I can do is speak to myself, and I didn't have those feelings. You would also, as I'm reading these, you would think this is probably a good guide to give maybe less experienced officers the understanding of what they're dealing with, with at an officer-involved shooting, right? I think it's always good to explain to officers what could happen if you're involved in a critical incident. Would you agree immediately following the incident the department should provide physical and psychological first aid to involve personnel including assignment of companion officer or peer counseling? The focus should be to support calming the stress. Yes. Do you agree the investigative process and potential consequences can be more the most stressful aspects of the incident? for the officers, and within the first few hours after the incident are often emotional and confusing. Do you agree with that? Every officer, with the exception of one, that I've interviewed in connection with an officer-involved shooting has always been willing to talk to me and provide me the information I need so that I could complete my investigation. Just like Mr. Randolph did, right? Mr. Randolph did that, and he, he talked with you, right? Yes. He, he did a walkthrough with you, right? <clears throat> Correct. So he did, according to you, you're saying about 10, 15 percent you saw videotaped of officers involved in shootings. He did the same thing, didn't he? That's correct. He did it without an attorney, didn't he? Yes. When an officer is involved in a shooting, they get him a representative, don't they? Union representative, maybe even an attorney, don't they? Correct. So that, that attorney could advise the officer about any potential consequences, right? Yes. Mr. Randolph did not have that, did he? at the no. time of the walk? He did not. Did you say there was a landline in that house? There were three landlines? I believe they're the handheld phones. Voice over. It's not a landline, is it? I call them a landline because they sit in a dock, so yes. On the night in question, after all these personnel have been conducting their business at that residence. It's fair to say that only three cartridges are recovered. Fair? Again, I didn't conduct the investigation of the crime scene. You would have to ask Detective O'Kelly. Would it surprise you, or would you dispute it, that it took more than a week to find two more cartridges? I know that when we went back to do the walkthrough, we found additional cartridge casings. During his first interview, Mr. Randolph, do you recall at approximately 1219, Mr. Randolph holding his mouth, or holding his mouth area, like not pain, I don't want to say pain, but just sort of something's distracting. Do you remember that? I remember him doing that on a few occasions. And he said that he had bitten his lip or something along those lines? Do you remember that in the walkthrough? He said he bit his lip or something. Yes. And he said that's when he came in contact with Mr. Miller and maybe the mask, and it had gone sideways, or gone up. Do you remember that? I believe that's what he said. If I could move backwards again to the officer involved shooting. Have you ever heard of the Lewinsky, Mr. Lewinsky, an expert named Lewinsky? I know him. He testifies that officers often have difficulty recounting exactly how many uh, bullets they fired. Objection, as soon as facts not evidence. If he knows. We can ask him that in the form of a 
question. Sure. Is that part of Mr. Lewinsky's uh, theory? Objection relevance? When we watched the video of Funnies, do you remember on direct examination the prosecution or Ms. Weckerly showed you? I do. And then you said it sort of ended. That was the complete video, right? Do you remember that? I thought that there was another one with a different angle that showed the vehicle traveling north on Rancho, but that might be the only angle. Okay. In fact, I want to show you this to sh see exactly when we lose sight of that, that vehicle. Can we do so? While he's looking for that, Mr. Randolph told you before he had gone to the charcoal room, he had dropped off Nicholas. Uh, that was his autistic Sharon... Sharon's autistic grandchild. That's correct. Do you remember in a call that you had with Mr. Randolph on June 23rd, 2008, he told you that he was going to share the... Objection, hearsay? They brought out every portion of Mr. Randolph. They brought Sweep a house. When you were a young patrol officer, did you have to sweep houses? Yes, sir. Can when I say sweep a house, tell the jury what I mean. It's uh, clearing a house to make sure that no one's hiding inside the house. How do we actually hear that on a night on the nine one one call? Don't we? I believe so. After Mr. Randolph is ordered out of the home, it sounds like two police officers go inside to sweep the home. Is that fair? Well, I don't know that you can tell how many officers enter the house. There would be a minimum of two. And what they're doing is they're going room to room, looking in closets, making sure there's nobody sort of hiding, right? That's correct. And that must be a very nerve-wracking process as a police officer. Is that fair? It can be. And it can take a while, can't it? Yes. It can take several minutes. Yes. And as a police officer, you want to make sure of that, like in this case, because there could be another perpetrator inside that home. That's correct. That's what the officers are looking for. And in fact, in this case on that 911, you hear officers like sort of commanding that if there's anybody inside, come out, that type of thing, right? Yes. You'd want to announce yourself as an officer so that people don't think you're some type of home invader, right? Yes. Now I'm going to go back to this video. And if we can watch the video, okay? Mm -hmm. For the record, this is Exhibit 315. And 
I want you to watch, strike that. You agree with me that when you first started watching this video, you incorrectly identified the vehicle, right? Yes, I incorrectly identified the dark vehicle that was parked here. It's the lighter car right here. Fair enough. And so I want to watch, we sort of stopped it, and I want to continue on until we can't see that vehicle any further, okay? Okay. And so it's driving away right now, correct? That's correct. Okay. And can we can you watch it and tell you and let us know when you cannot see it any further? Because it's gonna turn, right? Yes. Towards Rancho, right? Correct. Can you still see it? Yes. Okay, so I want to keep watching after the state's, the state's video turned off. Do you recall that? I do. And you could still see the vehicle at the time the state's video cut off, correct? Yes. Okay. So he's driving away, correct? That's correct. It's 82621, correct? Yes. I want you to tell me at the very time you can no longer see that vehicle. It's yeah, coming right. to a stop at the stop light. So right now it looks like he stopped in the turn bay. Okay. Okay. Okay, and what was the time? 8, 27? 27, 23, 24. Okay. So when you're doing the drive between Funnies and the house, okay, that would be the time we'd start that th three or four minute process, right? That's correct. And you would agree with me, I've driven that several times, y you would agree with me, it does depend on the lights, doesn't it? It does. Your Honor, I think I am getting very close to done. Do you think I could have a quick break just so I can make sure I'm, I'm, I'm finished? Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our afternoon recess. During this recess, you must understand the communicated anyone, including General Jury, and any readers on this case or its marriage. Either by voice, phone, email, text, internet, or other means of communication or social media. You must not rewatch, listen, and use the media comments or commentary about the case. 
You must not do any research, such as consulting dictionaries, using the internet, or using reference materials. You must not make any investigation, test the theory of the case, recreate any aspect of this case, or in any other way investigate or learn about the case on your own. And you must not form or trust any opinion regarding this case on the spot. Page 310 will be in recess until 325. All rise for the jury. I just remind you that you're still under on the CERT. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Your Honor. Detective Mark, I just have three very quick areas to go through with you. During an interview, the interview, the first one with uh, Mr. Randolph, and also in the walkthrough, he talks about when this incident is actually happening, going and trying to push the garage door because he may go, like the button, because he may go want to tell a neighbor, and then he stops it. Remember him saying that? I do. Okay. I want to show you what's been marked for identification purposes as a joint proposed exhibit B and see if you recognize it, okay? Yes, sir. May I approach him? Yes. And I showed this to the state. Does this appear to be a still shot of the walkthrough? Correct. Does it, do you see this object on the right-hand side? Garage door opener? Garage door opener, okay. May I publish it first? Can I have it admitted, Your Honor? Any objection to defenses B? No, Your Honor. Defenses B will be admitted. Permission to publish is granted. Thank you. Push it. Yes. Okay, so now I want to zoom in to this black thing on the side, you call it a garage door opener, right? Yes. Now, with garage door openers, sometimes there's a button to actually push so the garage door opens, right? That's correct. And also, there are some that you push and a light will come on in the garage. Push a button, the light comes on. Okay. You don't know that? I'm not familiar with that style, but yes. Okay. You don't dispute it? No. Mr. Randolph said in the walkthrough, that's what he was doing, he was pushing a button. Remember that? Tried to open the garage door and then stopped it. I recall. Okay. The prosecution 
Ms. Weckerly asked you if Mr. Randolph complained to you that it took a long time for uh, officers to go in the house. Do you remember that? I do. Isn't it in fact true that what he complained to you about is it seemed like it was hours before they ever went in there to do first aid or anything? Do you remember him saying that to you? I don't recall that. I just recall him saying that it took an inordinate amount of time for people to get into the house. If I showed you a copy of the transcript that we've just gone over, would that refresh your memory as to exactly? It would. Page 64, may I approach on it? Yes. No, Ms. Weckerly, it is the uh, May 9th. Thank you. Transcript. If you could just to yourself read this answer. Okay. Does that refresh your memory as to exactly what one of the things that you complained about that it seemed like hours before they ever came in there to do first aid or anything? Do you it does. That? And that's what he says, right? Yes. Okay, so now I'm just going to come to the 911 video, excuse me, audio. Jury hasn't heard it yet, but you have, right? I have. Okay. And after there's a part where Mr. Randolph, it appears you can hear officers sort of ordering him out of the house. That's correct. And you hear, as you pointed out, I said, two officers doing a sweep, clearing the house. And as you point out, you don't really know, I don't really know how many are in there. Fair? Correct. And then that audio is over 18 minutes long of the 911. Do you remember? I believe that's what it is. Because the phone is left on Sharon's body, isn't it? Yes. And it's live, isn't it? I believe so, yes. And if you've heard it, through that whole 18 minutes, you never ever hear medical in there, do you? I don't know if I heard medical or not. Okay. Again, you'll let the audio speak for itself, right? Certainly. Mr. Randolph was complaining that they weren't sending in medical. It took a long time, and medical didn't go in there to help Sharon. That's what he's saying, isn't it? That's correct. Medical won't go in until Metro secures the scene. Now, just one last area. Before, before crime scene analysts go in there, the scene has to be secure before medical would go in, right? That's correct. You don't want some paramedic from the fire department going in and having to encounter uh, a suspect with a gun, right? Correct. And so before crime scene analysts come in, medical would have come in? Yes. Last area, sir. You seem to... If I understand you right, talk about an officer involved shooting with Bueller, right? Yes. Were you in the military before you were a police officer? I was. What branch, sir? Air Force. How long? 20 years. And then 35 years as a police officer? 27. I'm sorry, I tried that I'm sorry. You were trained in... We talked about you trained in how to, to do a sweep of a house, right? Yes. You trained uh, how to deal with officer-involved shootings, how to Correct. investigate them, right? Yes. You, were, you went to the police academy, right? Yes. You were trained as a military, uh, a, a military personnel, weren't you? Yes. And when I read all of those different mental and psychological factors, it was discussing what happens to some trained police officers, right? Correct. It's somewhat different, isn't it? If, in fact, a homeowner has come into a house, his wife's been murdered, and he's being 
in a firefight where he's just killed somebody. Would you agree that the average person, not like yourself, is not trained for something like that? I'm sorry, there was a, I didn't understand the question. So that an average ordinary Joe isn't trained for that type of situation, right? That's correct. They are not trained for that. Police officers are. They're trained when to shoot, how to handle these situations to the best the police can train, to the best the police department can train officers, right? Police officers are trained to react to deadly force situations. Not Joe civilians, right? Right? Not Joe civilians, average civilians, <clears throat> right? Well, I can't tell how one person would react to the shooting of a person as opposed to another. I've investigated numerous incidents where homeowners have shot an intruder. So, sir, my question is, those people were not trained in that situation, right? They were not trained. And everybody acts differently, don't they? They do. That concludes cross-examination. Thank you. Let's um, start off on that. Um, Mr. Orm read you a bunch of quotations, and I think the source was the International Association of the Chiefs of Police. Um, I don't know what, like it's like a governing body, I think you said, for people that are not officers, but supervisors. Is that fair? That's their main focus. They also provide training, but their main focus is management. Okay. And is that, in your estimation, sort of the preeminent resource on officer-involved shootings? It is not. Is that a resource that you ever encountered in your uh, training when you were investigating officer-involved shootings? I'm familiar with several different Mr. Orm was talking to you um, about walkthroughs, and he had indicated that, um, well, in his question, he uh, asked if it was really very rare for a walkthrough to be videotaped. Um, but I believe your answer was that on about 10 or possibly more occasions, you've actually done video walkthroughs with officers? I'm aware of at least 10 that were done. I've done a few with officers who had been involved in officer-involved shootings, including one that I was involved in that I did the walkthrough. Okay, and what is, why do a walkthrough? What is, what is the purpose of doing a walkthrough? So normally when we interview, I'll say a homeowner for instance, and the homeowner says, I was standing here and I fired that way, and these are the different things that were going on at the time, it's easier if we have you standing there and showing us what you were doing as opposed to just sitting in a room and talking about it because we don't get the reaction that you have if you're standing there and reenacting something for us. So another example would be an officer involved shooting. If an officer is standing in one position, he can point to the distance, approximate distance to where the suspect was standing. He can describe the movements of the suspect. He can describe and reenact his movements and show you which direction he was firing. A lot of times officers will recount just saying, you know, bang, bang. They don't really remember how many times they fired, but when they reenact it, it comes back to them. So often, like, being back in the place and doing a reenactment helps people uh, remember details that they might have not have been able to articulate instant, uh, like closer to the event, I guess I should say. Correct. Okay. Now, when you um, uh, spoke to Mr. Ram uh, Randolph um, at that time, obviously, as Mr. Oram uh, concluded his cross-examination, you, you knew that he wasn't a police officer. That's correct. And uh, he was a civilian. Yes. And over the course of your career, um, you have had the opportunity to um, interview civilian people who reported shootings. Yes. 
um, and people who reported shooting in self-defense. That's correct. Okay. And you were able to make observations about Mr. Randolph and based on your experience, the investigation moved where it moved. That's correct. Okay. Now, um, in, I think it was, in, on cross-examination, um, Mr. Oram was asking you about um, the, the surveillance timing at the gas uh, at the gas station at the Funnies gas station. Yes. Um, do you recall if the the financial transaction was referenced in the um, officer's report in order to sort of, to sort of cross reference the timing of the video with the financial transaction, so you can kind of match up if the video is off in terms of timing. It was. Um, do you recall what time the financial transaction was? If I could refer to the report. <laughs> yes. Um, that would have been memorialized in Detective O'Kelly's report. If you can't find it, uh, Council, it's the middle of the page on page 25. I have it if I can approach. I have it. You have it? I do. Do you see it in the middle of the page there? Yes. Okay. So having looked at um, the officer's report, does that refresh your recollection as to the timing of the actual money transaction for the gas? Yes. And what time was that? 2024 okay. on May 8th, which is 824 p.m. Okay. And then that corresponds with the surveillance that we're seeing as well? Correct. And had there been a big differential um, between the surveillance and the timing, the the financial transaction would have been off as well, or wouldn't have been off, right? That one would have been right, and you could calculate the difference um, from the surveillance. That's correct. Plus, I would have noted it if there was a, a significant deviation in time. Okay, and there's no notation of a significant deviation in time in the officer's report? There is not. Um, when you were speaking with Mr. Randolph with um, Detective Hardy, um, on the 9th, um, did he appear to um, have trouble hearing yourself or Detective Hardy? Not at all. Uh, Mr. Oren asked you um, about a comment that Mr. Randolph made about um, Sharon Randolph leaving shoes out in the residence. Do you recall that on cross-examination? Yes. Um, do you recall um, sort of what he described as an interaction in their household about shoes? Sharon's shoes, I guess? I yes. Okay, what was that? He became visibly agitated and used profanity and banged on the wall. And that was about like sort of remembering Sharon leaving shoes out? Yes. Now, with regard to um, the jewelry, you were asked um, questions about you were shown that photo of the jewelry laid out on the table. Correct. Um, would you defer to Sharon's daughter, Colleen, describing the worth of the jewelry as she may be more, I guess, I don't want to say more aware of its value than you were because of the relationship with her mother? Absolutely. Now, Mr. Oram um, showed you some photographs. I put on the overhead what's been and I think you asked to have him zoom in on this drawer I did okay I'm gonna zoom in is that close enough yes what were you wanting to explain about this drawer so it doesn't look like anything in that drawer is disheveled to some point where you're digging through there looking for items because it, the door is open, but there's nothing like tossed out of it. Correct. Um, another uh, photo that was referenced on cross-examination, I think you said it struck you as odd. This is States 116. Let me zoom back out. 
looking at that photograph, was that another one that you referenced as um, looking odd to you? Yes. And why is that? Because these are also small drawers. And why would you only open them part way when you completely pulled the other drawers out of the small box that was hanging on the wall? It just seems like if you're going to pull one set of drawers out, these also are not affixed to that box, and they could easily be pulled out. So would you have, like, expected these to be pulled out and all the way on the floor? At least some of them pulled out. If there was something in them, dumped out, gone through. These just seemed like they were randomly pulled back. And then now I'm putting on the overhead what's been admitted as States 126. I think oops, we're in that office area. Does that room appear to be um, disturbed? No. I know Detective O'Kelly was um, in charge of the scene, um, but do you recall whether or not you saw like a bicycle at the scene? Or would you defer to him? I did not see one out in front of the house. I would have to defer to him for the back. Mr. Orham asked you um, at the very beginning of the cross-examination um, To, or he asked if Mr. Randolph suggested to you that he had been hired to do odd jobs and that there was some conversation about odd jobs. Do you remember that sort of series of questions? I do. None of those facts um, would preclude Mr. Randolph being involved in his wife's and Mr. Miller's murder, would it? No. Thank you, sir. Uh, that concludes, I guess, recross. Redirect? Or redirect? Mm -hmm. Redirect. Detective, a bike wasn't located, was it? No. And in your experience, robbery, burglary, some people have getaway drivers, don't they? That's correct. Was there any vehicle associated with Michael Miller with that evening? In other words, that either got him there or was going to take him away? Only Mr. Randolph's. M Mr. Randolph had driven his wife, we can see that, from... Santa Fe to Funnies and then home, right? Correct. Mr. Randolph calls 911, right? Yes. So what I'm asking was, was there any investigation done by you, or if you're aware of any, about any potential getaway driver for Mr. Miller? I did not conduct a separate investigation as to whether or not there was a separate getaway driver for Mr. Miller. What type of vehicle did Mr. Miller's girlfriend drive? <clears throat> I don't know. Nothing further. Do the ladies and gentlemen of the jury have any questions for this witness? Okay, if you can write your question on a full sheet of paper with your name and your juror number. Counsel, do you have
Detective Bob? Yes, Your Honor. At any point during your interview or walkthrough or contact with Mr. Rendell, did you see him crying or very emotional about what had happened on the evening of May 8th? No. State, any follow-up based on the juror questions? No, Your Honor. Defense, any follow-up based on the juror questions? No, Your Honor. All right. Do you have any other questions for ladies and gentlemen of the jury? You can write your question on a full sheet of paper with your name and your juror number. Counsel, if you'd approach. Okay, so Detective Monk, were the drawers dusted for fingerprints? That's something I can't answer. That would have to be addressed to Detective O'Kelley. Any follow-up on that, Ms. Burgess? I know you just briefly walked the scene, but are you aware of whether or not Mr. Miller had gloves on when he was found in the garage? He did. Thank you. Just one question on that. Okay. With regard to emotion, you remember the 911 call, right? I do. You remember hearing Mr. Randolph screaming during the 911 call? That never happened in front of me. Okay, that's not my question. When you listen to the 911 call, you hear him screaming, don't you? You hear that on the 911 call. You hear him screaming, oh, God, Sharon. Do you remember that? I recall that. When he rolls over the body, you hear his reaction. Objection, Your Honor. I have nothing further. Okay. Any other questions from the ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Okay. Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Is that yeah. correct? Correct. Okay. Um, what does the 080508 stand for? It'll be the year, the month, and the date. Okay, so that's 2008, May 8th. Is that correct? Correct. What does the 3131 stand for at the end? That'll be the incident number that is issued for the call that just once it's generated. Each call will get assigned an event number or incident number. Okay, so the very first call of the day would be, you know, 000001 at the end, correct? Correct. So this was the 3,131st call of the entire day, correct? Correct. All right. Um, have you had an opportunity to listen to the 911 call from that day? Yes. All right. At this time, we are going to play what has been, I believe there's no objection, stage for post 324. Um, when I said the call from that day, I know there were 3,131 calls. Uh, however, I'm in referencing um, that particular event number ending in 3131. Yes. Okay, so you've listened to that specific call. Correct. Okay. At this time, we're going to play that 911 call. What is the uh, number on that? 324, Your Honor. Any objection to 324? None at all. Are you moving to admit 324 before you publish it? Yes, Your Honor. All right, 324 will be admitted and permission to publish. Thank you. May 8th, 2008, 20 hours, 40 or minutes, 50 or seconds. 911 emergency, Hernandez, 842. My wife's been shot and there's a bag in my house that I shot him. Have you shot Yes, well, as far as I know, I didn't. 
I'm in good shot. Okay, be careful. I'm going to put this thing down and get my gun. on his wife or on the person that he's dealing with? No. Okay. Uh, but he is being directed to do that, is that correct? Correct. What's the time on that? Can you tell me how many, if you look on your, uh, can you see it on your screen there? How many minutes have elapsed? Uh, six minutes and 44 seconds. Okay. Do you recall the caller asking whether he should go lock the front door? No. During this call? If he should lock the, I'm sorry. If he should go and lock the front door. Do you recall him saying that on the call? No. Okay. All right. You got to count as you're doing it. Count. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go back a few seconds. About the six minute mark. Put your other hand on top of that. I just want you to continue to do compressions. Keep doing them. I should open the garage door, shouldn't I? No. Keep... 
There's another 10 minutes of this call. Is that, is that correct? Correct. Um, and I think it kind of runs until ultimately it's disconnected. Is that okay? Correct. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, you mentioned that you've worked for dispatch for 19 years. Is that what you said? Correct. On average, how many calls have you heard in, uh, on average in a year? Hundreds. Okay. Um, have you often heard calls where someone is calling where someone's been shot, offering to do things in the alternative other than trying to resuscitate somebody? No. And you've been doing this for 19 years? Yes. You've also reviewed um, the what's called uh, the CAD log in this case, is that correct? Yes. And that is a log that does what? What does it kind of track? It's going to track uh, when officers arrive en route. What's an updated by the call taker, date, time, stamped? Okay. Let the record reflect and showing opposing counsel the proposed 125. No objection to his admission. At this time, we ask for permission to admit states proposed 325. Oh, 325, yeah. Thank you. May I approach the witness? Yes. 325 is Why don't you take a look at this first page here? There are usually like a series of codes that are here that kind of, uh, they're shorthand, is that right? Yes. Um, what's the code for arrival when an officer arrives? AR. Okay. Do you see the first entry where an officer arrives at? Yes. And, and, and when is that? At 2050 hours. Okay. So that's a 24 hour clock. So that means 850 at night. PM. Correct. Okay. So about 20 minutes earlier than around from 830 at night. Correct. Okay. I just see that. And if you look at that mouse, if we can cube over. You could see if this. I don't know why it's so is like this. Let's see this way. It's okay. I don't know. We'll see. Hold on. That's not great. Ah, that's better. Can you show us where you saw that indication that an officer arrived? at 2050, maybe take your mouse and show us. Arrived at 2050 and AR for arrived. Okay. Thank you very much. I have no further questions at this time.
afternoon, Ms. Corn. Hello. You've been doing this 19 years, huh? Yes. Okay. So, horrible math, but back in 2008, you hadn't been doing it 19 years, right? Correct. About three and a half, four years at the time? Correct. Okay. Um, just to be clear, um, you're not given any actual responsibility for this call, right? Correct. You're not on the phone, correct? Correct. You're not dispatching anyone to this call, right? Correct. You're not in any way involved in the investigation of this event that took place in May of 2008, correct? Correct. Okay. Do you know how it is that these prosecutors selected you to come here and testify? I'm currently a custodian of records. Okay. Um, custodian of records is someone that maintains documents in the ordinary course of business at a business entity, right? Correct. And so when Metro gets a subpoena and someone's to come to court to talk about Metro records, you are one of the people that can come to court, correct? Correct. And I'm assuming in preparation for your testimony, you had an opportunity to talk to the prosecutors in this case, right? Correct. And Mr. Hamner, the guy that just asked you questions, you've actually spoken to him a few times, right? Correct. And he told you, I'm going to ask you these questions, right? Correct. Like how many times in your career has someone done X, Y, Z, right? Um, and he told you, I'm going to ask you, at this point on this particular tape, do you hear someone giving chest compressions, right? Correct. Okay. And so you knew that question was coming and you knew what your answer was going to be, correct? Correct. Okay. Can you explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what a chest compression sounds like? No, I cannot. Because a chest compression doesn't have a sound, right? Right. You'd agree with me that in preparation for your testimony, you actually listen to the audio of this 911 call, right? Yes. And you hear a man who's clearly in distress, yes? Yes. Crying, yes? Yes. Screaming, yes? Yes. Asking for help, yes? Yes. And you hear kind of a rhythmic breathing sound, like a uh, 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 at the time he's told to give chest compressions, right? I hear someone that sounds out of breath. Yeah, you'd agree with me, you hear that sound, right? Correct. You'd agree with me if someone's involved in a shooting where they've just taken the life of someone that killed their spouse, they might be out of breath, right? Possibly. Okay. And in fact, someone giving that rhythmic breathing in like a consistent fashion, they might be given chest compressions, right? Possibly. Okay. When you told the ladies and gentlemen of the jury that you didn't hear anyone in that audio giving chest compressions. You really have no idea, do you? Correct. Okay. The state also asked you a question about when in your experience has Metro's system not been able to handle the call volume? Do you remember those questions? Yes. Okay, and you gave us an example, right? Correct. And that was one October, right? Correct. When a whole lot of people were calling into 911 related to a massive event, right? Right. And the system wasn't able to handle that event, right? Correct. Okay. You know, don't you, that if someone doesn't have the ability to utilize a phone line, it doesn't matter whether your system can handle the call, right? Right. For instance, if I don't have service on my cellular telephone because the battery's dead or I'm out of range and I dial 911, you're never going to have a dispatcher pick that up, correct? Correct. Okay. And likewise, if I have a voice over internet protocol provider, an internet phone service, and I dial my number but my service is down, your 911 operator is never going to hear that call either, right? Objection. It will be beyond the scope of direction, please. She was just about to answer. Well, I think this, this line of questioning was brought up during her direct examination as to whether or not they could miss a call. So I'm going to allow her that objection is overruled. Ma'am, you can answer the question. We do receive calls that are disconnected on like a 911 pre a prefix phone. Those do come through. Okay. I'm saying a call on a voice over internet <coughs> protocol mm -hmm. where the internet gives me a voice service. If my internet's down, that call can't get to you, right? Oh, right. Okay. So if I have one of those providers and I'm trying to dial 911, but there's no line to get to the 911 dispatcher, it doesn't matter because you're never going to hear it, right? Right, with no internet service. Right. That's accurate, correct? Ac mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Okay. There's a 
couple things that Mr. Hamner asked you, and I wrote down some specific times. When he went back and played that audio for you at 636, the person on the call says, should I go open the garage door, right? Correct. You have an understanding that that person's trying to get help into the residence, right? To let officers or medical in? Right. And he's saying, I can't do it. There's so much blood. You can hear him struggling to get her turned over and following the instructions. You hear that, right? Yes. Okay. Um, you'd agree with me that opening the garage door is one way to let people in, right? Yes. Okay. And it appears that that's what he's trying to do, correct? Possibly. Okay. Let's talk about the CAD report. Okay. The CAD report stands for Computer Aided Dispatch, right? Yes. And that's a document that's generated through a computer system when a call comes into Metro, someone's putting information in a computer, right? Yes. And that information's being relayed to responding officers and medical personnel, correct? Correct. That way they can know what's going on at the scene they're coming up to, correct? Correct. And there are things that are given to those calls, like 400 codes, correct? Right. And you know what a 400 code is, correct? Yes. A 400 code is one that's assigned by Metro to a particular type of call, right? Right. If I say 413, what's that mean? A gun. So Personal like if gun. I'm saying that there's someone with a gun, I might call 911 and say, Help me, there's someone with a gun, and the dispatcher would type to the responding officer, 413 in progress, right? Right. What's 419 mean? Dead body. So in this particular case, there's actually communication on the phone line between Mr. Randolph, the guy who calls the 911 mm -hmm. system, and the other person on the line about whether or not the guy's dead, right? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. And because you've reviewed the CAD, you know that that's entered in there, confirmed 419, right? Yes. And 413 related to someone being there with a gun, right? Yes. Because in real time, as he's communicating in words what's going on, someone's typing that down in the computer system, right? Yes. Now, Mr. Hamner asked you about a two-letter code, and those are throughout the CAD report, right? Yes. And they include things like ER, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. AS, correct? Yes. And I think you talked about AR, right? Yes. What does ER mean? En route. Meaning I'm on my way, I'm going to put that in, I'll assign myself that call, right? Yes. What does AS mean? Assigned. Meaning that person's assigned to that particular event number, right? Yes. And you told us already that AR means arrived, correct? Right. Okay. I think you told us that someone arrived at that residence at 2050 hours, correct? Correct. Okay, I want to back up just to the inception of the call, okay? It's been represented to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury that the call originates at um, 2045 hours. Yes. Okay. You'd agree with me that corresponds to when it's entered into the CAD system, right? Right, when the call's generated. On a 911 call, you've probably heard it a million times, I know I have, that little kind of computer voice where it says, the time of the call in military or police time, right? Right. Okay. What's the time that that voice says at the beginning of this call? I'd have to re-listen to it. Okay. If it said 2044 hours, you wouldn't dispute that, would you? If it said that, no. Okay. But when we say 2045, that's when someone actually is typing into the computer, correct? Correct, when it's generated. That happens after a call is placed, right? During a call. It's assigned into the computer after the call is placed, correct? Yes. After someone makes a few representations on the phone, right? Right. And then it's entered into the computer, right? Yes. Okay. So to say it starts at 2045, the process actually begins before that, right? Correct. You don't have any idea what time they actually dial 911, right? We'd have to look. I don't know offhand, no. Okay. You made the representation that someone arrives at this call at 2050 hours, yes? Correct, yes. Did you look at the CAD report as to when someone actually went in the residence at 6517 Rancho Santa Fe? No, I just looked at the arrive time. Okay. Would it surprise you to know that there was a long period of time when people couldn't get into the house? No. That happens, right? Yes. So someone might arrive at a call and be standing right outside and the person inside that's asking for help desperately wants them to come in 
and they're not inside, right? Possibly, yes. Okay. And Mr. Hamner actually asked you about the 10 minutes this call goes on. Have you listened to that? Yes. Do you know what happens in that 10 minutes? I'm not sure what you're referring to. As far Do as you know what happens in that 10 minutes that the call goes on? At the beginning of the call? No, at the end. The party <coughs> didn't play. Oh, the end. Do I know what's going on? Yes. It's an open, just an open line. Okay. That you can hear <coughs> in the background. You can hear things in the background, mm -hmm. right? Right. Do you ever hear medical responding on that call? No. Okay. If I were to give you a copy of the CAD report, could you tell me when someone from medical response actually got to Sharon Randolph's body? Possibly, if it's in there. Can I approach? Yes. Hand me what the state admitted is number 325. Take a peek and tell me if you can identify that. Yeah, I don't see where medical, once they updated medicals arrived, just who responded. So there's a whole lot of entries about officers that are assigned that call, right? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Officers that are en route to that call, correct? Yes. Law enforcement response to Mr. Randolph's request for help, right? Yes. And you can't tell us when medical ever arrives on that scene, correct? Correct. Nothing further. Yes. So do you remember um, on cross-examination there were questions about the difference between a catalog generating 2045 versus uh, the, the digital computer voice at the beginning of a 911 call. Do you remember that? Yes. Uh, do you remember him saying, do you remember the computer voice saying 2044? Do you remember him saying that to you on cross? Yes. Do you recall whether or not he provided you the seconds? I know he gave you the hours and the minutes, but did he give you the seconds? No, not that I recall. Okay. And I mean, 60, 60 seconds could be potentially a big deal, right? Because if it's 204401, it's much closer to 2044, correct? Versus, I don't know, 204454, right? That's closer to 2045. Would that be accurate? Right. All right. You would agree with me as a custodian of record that that digital voice that comes on, that is when the caller connects with 911. Yes. All right. I'm going to re replay that 911. Call. 8, 20 hours. Forty four minutes, fifty four seconds. How many seconds did that little computer say? Fifty four. So six seconds before twenty forty five. Correct? I mean there was a lot of questions about it. a lot of things can happen before on the catalog, but this call is connecting six seconds before we hit twenty forty five. Correct. Another question that was asked was, you weren't able to determine um, when medical personnel was able to literally check on the person. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, we listened to about eight minutes of that call. Is that right? Yes. There was someone inside the home that was alive, right? The caller. Right. Okay. Um, and then this call goes on for another 10 minutes. Is that right? Yes. So we don't know what efforts the caller made to let those people in, and we don't know what steps were took. Is that right? Right. But we do know from the CAD report, but by 2050, there are police outside that house. Yes. And we know from by 2044, 54, there is a living human being inside that house. Correct? Correct. Presumably wanting to get help. Correct. Okay. And we don't know when that door finally got open to let those people in to tend to that woman. Right. But we know the caller was in there. Yes. Thank you. I have no further questions. Nothing further. Yes. 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 Y
Did the ladies and gentlemen of the jury have any questions for this witness? Okay, seeing no response, ma'am, you are excused. Thank you very much for your testimony here today. Thank you, Councilor Birch. We anticipate the next witness may be taking longer than 30 minutes. That's what I was up here talking about. And we don't want to keep you guys past five and make anybody miss anything. And I made some promises to you last week that we intend to keep. So at this point, we are going to take our night recess. During this recess, you must not discuss or communicate with anyone, including fellow jurors, in any way regarding the case or its merits, either by voice, phone, email, text, internet, or other means of communication or social media. You must not read, watch, listen to news or media accounts or commentary about the case. You must not do any research, such as consulting dictionaries, using the internet, or using reference materials. You must not make any investigation, test theory of the case, recreate any aspect of the case, or in any other way investigate or learn about the case on your own. You must not form or express any opinion regarding this case, so it's fine to make you. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be in recess until tomorrow morning at 10.30. All rise for the jury. We're outside the presence of our jury. So we will start tomorrow morning with this witness, and this is the, the firearms. firearms person? Yes. Okay. And Mr. Hamlin, I'm sorry, you got cut off, but I just didn't want them to keep waiting. So we were in the process of having some scheduling discussions. We were. I, so 
we have a we have a CSA we need to call. There are a few DNA people that we believe are quite short. Okay. We have Mr. S we have Randall Stone. Um, we have Randy McPhail. Um, okay. Sorry. Doctor Davin. Uh, we have three of the Millers who I don't know that will be very long. And then we have Detective Guzman who's just going over just some analysis of just phone calls, but it's not it's not historical tower data. It's just calls and frequencies and things like that. Okay. And then last we have Dino Kelly. I mean, that, that's basically it. So I mean, we, we feel, I think we feel pretty strongly that we would be probably done with our witnesses by Friday. Would that be correct, Pam? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we're still on track. We're on track. Okay. They, they told us to bring witnesses on Friday, and I wondered if that's still the case. Yeah, I think so. Bring witnesses. Because yeah. I'm, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but on Thursday, did you say we'll start at 10? 11. 11. I'm on the back end, and there's two Zans things up. Okay. Yeah. I so still think we'll be okay. One question. We do have an out-of-state witness who's an expert. Okay. I'd prefer not to bring him in Friday to sit here if he's going to bump till Monday. Understood. But we do have a local expert that can definitely come in Friday. Well, I mean, I'm just thinking just based on the time. <laughs> I mean, it's going to take some time with Detective O'Kelly. I, I think we have to factor that in. Because uh, that's always how it works. It would probably be better if you guys had your local witness lined up for Friday afternoon and be able to put them on. And then if we have to, then we can go forward and just do your out of state witness Monday after that calendar. Okay, okay. And then tomorrow morning when we start, we've got a stipulation as to the majority of the evidence. Okay. I think our plan is, is, at least it relates to the photographs, just to say there's a stipulation and move all of it in so we don't have to take time with foundations. Okay. Probably with the physical. Yeah, too, right? with the physical as well. Okay. All right. Well, you guys can discuss that and just make sure you have the numbers. Okay. Put that on the right here. Thank you very much, sir. Anything else we need to do outside the presence? Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. Well, remember, Friday is a one o'clock start. But I'm available any other day at eight if you guys it's are. One o'clock start. One o'clock start on Friday. I have to do something at the morning <laughs> that I tried to get out of, but I can't. So it. it yes. But I'm available to make up that time any other day at 8, so you guys just let me know. <laughs> Tomorrow we're 10.30 though, right? Yes. Okay. All right, I like the 1 o'clock start. Yeah. <laughs> Got to do my calendar. But yeah, Thursday it'll be 11. Okay.